Chapter 9 of The Secret Power by Marie Corelli. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This chapter read by Vaughan McCarthy. Chapter 9 At almost the same moment, Gaspard stumbled to his feet. Asleep, asleep, he exclaimed. Mon Dieu, the shame of it, the shame. What pigs are men? To sleep after food and wine, and to leave a woman alone like this, the shame. Morgana, quietly steering the white eagle, smiled. Poor Gaspard, she said. You could not help it. You were so tired. And you, Marquesse, you were both quite worn out. I was glad to see you sleeping. There is no shame in it. As I have often told you, I can manage the ship alone. But Rivardi was white with anger and self-reproach. Gross pigs are we, he said hotly. Gaspard is right. And yet, here he passed a hand across his brow and tried to collect his thoughts. Yes, surely something unusual must have happened. We heard bells ringing. Morgana watched him closely, her hand on her air vessel's helm. Yes, we all thought we heard bells, she said, but that was a noise in our own brains, the clamour of our own blood brought on by pressure. We were flying at too great a height, and the tension was too strong. Gaspard threw out his hands with a half-defiant gesture. No, madama, it could not be so. I swear we never left our own level. What happened I cannot tell, but I felt that I was struck by a sudden blow and I fell without force to recover. Sleep struck you that sudden blow, you poor Gaspard, said Morgana. And you have not slept so long, barely an hour, just long enough for me to hover a while above this black desert and then turn homeward. I want no more of the Sahara. Rivardi, smarting under a sense of loss and incompetency, went up to her. Give me the helm, he said, almost sharply. You have done enough. She resigned her place to him, smiling at his irritation. You are sure you are quite rested? she asked. Rested, he echoed the word disdainfully. I should never have rested at all had I been half the man I profess to be. Why do you turn back? I thought you were bent on exploring the great desert. That you meant to try and find the traditional brazen city? She shrugged her shoulders. I do not like the prospect, she said. There is nothing but sand, interminable billows of sand. I can well believe it was all ocean once, when the earth gave a sudden tilt, and all the water was thrown off from one surface to another. If we could dig deep enough below the sand, I think we should find remains of wrecked ships with the skeletons of antediluvian men and animals, remains of one of the many wasted civilizations. You do not answer me, interrupted Rivardi with impatience. What of your search for the brazen city? She raised her lovely mysterious eyes and looked full at him. Do you believe it exists? she asked. He gave a gesture of annoyance. Whether I believe or not is of no importance, he answered. You have some idea about it and you have every means of proving the truth of your idea. Yet after making the journey from Sicily for the purpose, you suddenly turn back. Still, she kept her eyes upon him. You must not mind the caprices of a woman, she said, with a smile. And do please remember, the brazen city is not my idea. The legend of this undiscovered place in the desert was related by your friend, Don Aloysius and he was careful to say it was only a legend. Why should you think I accept it as a truth? Surely it was the motive of your flight here? he demanded imperatively. Her brows drew together in a slight frown. My dear Marquise, I allow no one to question my motives, she said with sudden coldness. That I have decided to go no farther in search of the brazen city is my own affair. But, 
not even to wait for the full daylight, he expostulated. You could not see it by night, even if it existed. Not unless it was lit like other cities, she said, smiling. I suppose if such a city existed, its inhabitants would need some sort of illuminant. They would not grope about in the dark. In that case, it would be seen from our ship, as well by night as by day. Gaspard, busy with some mechanical detail, looked up. Then why not make a search for it while we are here, he said. You evidently believe in it. I have turned the white eagle homeward, and shall not turn again, she said. But I do not see any reason why such a city should not exist and be discovered some day. Explorers in tropical forests find the remains or beginnings of a different race of men from our own, pygmies, and such like beings. There is nothing really against the possibility of an undiscovered city in the great desert. We modern folk think we know a great deal, but our wisdom is very superficial and our knowledge limited. We have not mastered everything under the sun. The Marchese Rivardi looked at her with something of defiance in his glance. I will adventure in search of the legendary city myself alone, he said. Morgana laughed, her clear little cold laugh of disdain. Do so, my friend. Why not? she said. You are a daring airman on many forms of airships. I knew that before I entrusted you with this scheme of mine. Discover the legendary brazen city if you can. I promise not to be jealous, and return to the world of curiosity mongers, also if you can, with a full report of its inhabitants and their manners and customs. And so you will become famous, but you must not fall asleep on the way. He paled with anger and annoyance. She still smiled. Do not be cross, amico, she said sweetly. Think where we are, in the wide spaces of heaven, pilgrims with the stars. This is no place for personal feeling of either disappointment or irritation. You asked me a while ago if I was tired. I thought I was hot, but I am very tired. I am going to rest, and I trust you both to take care of me and the white eagle. We are to make straight for Sicily? he asked. Yes, straight for Sicily. She retired into her sleeping cabin and disappeared. The Marquise Rivardi looked at Gaspard questioningly. We must obey her, I suppose. We could not think of disobeying, returned Gaspard. She is a strange woman. And as he spoke, Rivardi gripped his steering gear with a kind of vindictive force. It seems absurd that we, two men of fair intelligence and scientific attainment, shall be ruled by her whim, her fancies, for after all, she is made up of fancies. Gaspard shook his finger warningly. This airship is not a whim or a fancy, he said impressively. It is the most wonderful thing of its kind ever invented. If it is given to the world, it will revolutionize the whole system of aerial navigation. Here we are, flying at top speed in perfect ease and safety, with no engine, nothing to catch fire, nothing to break or bust, and the whole mechanism mysteriously makes its own motive power as it goes. Radioactivity, it may be but its condensation and use for such a purpose is the secret invention of a woman, and surely we must admit her genius. As for our obedience, Excellenza, we are both royally paid to obey. Rivardi flushed red. I know, he said curtly, I never forget it, but money is not everything. Gaspard's mobile French face lit up with a mirthful smile. It is most things, he replied. Without it, even science is crippled. And this lady has so much of it. It seems without end. Again, it is seldom one meets with money and brains and beauty altogether. Beauty? Rivardi queried. Why, yes. Beauty that only flashes out at moments. Of all beauty, the most fascinating. A face that is always beautiful is fatiguing. 
It is the changeful face with endless play of expression that enthralls. Or so it is to me. And Gaspard gave an eloquent gesture. This lady we both work for seems to have no lovers, but if she had, not one of them could ever forget her. Rivardi was silent. I should not wonder, ventured Gaspard presently, if while we slept she had seen her brazen city. Rivardi uttered something like an oath. Impossible, he exclaimed. She would have awakened us. If she could, no doubt, agreed Gaspard. But if she could not, how then? For a moment Rivardi looked puzzled. Then he dismissed his companion's suggestion with a contemptuous shrug. Basta, there is no brazen city. When she heard the old tradition, she was like a child with a fairy tale. A child who, reading of the strawberries growing in the winter snow, goes out forthwith to find them. She did not really believe in it but it pleased her to imagine she did. The mere sight of the arid, empty desert has been enough for her. We certainly heard bells, said Gaspard. In our brains. Such sounds often affect the nerves when flying for a long while at high speed. For all our cleverness, we are only human. I have heard on the wireless sounds that do not seem of this world at all. So have I, said Gaspard and though it may be my own brain talking, I'm not so obstinate in my own knowledge as to doubt a possible existing means of communication between one continent and another apart from our special wireless. In fact, I'm sure there is something of the kind, though where it comes from and how it travels I cannot say, but certain people get news of occurring events somehow, from somewhere, long before it reaches Paris or London. I dare say the lady we are with could tell us something about it. Her powers are not limitless, said Rivardi. She is only a woman after all. Gaspard said no more, and there followed a silence. A silence all the more tense and deep because of the amazing swiftness with which the white eagle kept its steady level flight, making no sound despite the rapidity of its movement. Very gradually, the darkness of night lifted, as it were, one corner of its sable curtain to show a grey peephole of dawn, and soon it became apparent that the ship was already far away from the mysterious land of Egypt, the land shadowing with wings, and was flying over the sea. There was something terrific in the complete noiselessness with which it sped through the air, and Rivardi and now he had a good grip on his nerves, hardly dared allow himself to think of the adventurous business on which he was engaged. A certain sense of pride and triumph filled him, to realise that he had been selected from many applicants for the post he occupied, and yet with all his satisfaction there went a lurking spirit of envy and disappointed ambition. If he could win Morgana's love, if he could make the strange elfin creature, with all her genius and inventive ability his own, why then? What then? He would share in her fame. I more than share it, since it is the way of the world to give its honour to no woman whose life is connected with that of a man. The man receives the acknowledgement invariably, even if he has done nothing to deserve it. And herein, is the reason why many gifted women do not marry and prefer to stand alone in effort and achievement rather than have their hardly won renown filched from them by unjust hands. When Roger Seaton confessed to the girl Manella that his real desire was to bend and subdue Morgana's intellectuality to his own, he spoke for the truth, not only for himself, but for all men, Absolutely disinterested love for a brilliantly endowed woman could be difficult to find in any male creature. Men love what is inferior to themselves, not superior. Thus women who are endowed with more than common intellectual ability have to choose one of two alternatives. Love, or what is called love and childbearing, or fame and lifelong loneliness. 
the Marquesse Rivardi, thinking along the usual line of masculine logic, had frequently turned over the problem of Morgana's complex character such as it appeared to him, and had almost come to the conclusion that if he only had patience, he would succeed in persuading her that wifehood and motherhood were more conducive to a woman's happiness than all the most amazing triumphs of scientific discovery and attainment. He was perfectly right according to simple natural law, but he chose to forget that women's mental outlook has, in these modern days, been greatly widened, whether for their gain or loss it is not yet easy to say. Even for men, much knowledge increaseth sorrow, and it may be hinted that women, with their often overstrung emotions and exaggerated sentiments, are not fit to plunge deeply into studies which tax the brain to its utmost capacity and try the nerves beyond the level of calm which is essential to health. Though it has to be admitted that married life is less peaceful than hard study, and the bright woman who recently said, a husband is more trying than any problem in Euclid, no doubt had good cause for the remark. Married or single, woman both physically and mentally is the greatest sufferer in the world. Her time of youth and unthinking joy is brief, her martyrdom long, and it is hardly wonderful that she goes so often to the bad, where there is so little offered to attract her towards the good. Rivardi, letting himself go on the flood tide of hope and ambition, pleased his mind with imaginary pictures of Morgana as his wife and as mother of his children, rehabilitating his fallen fortunes, restoring his once great house, and building a fresh inheritance for its former renown. He saw no reason why this should not be, yet even while he indulged in his thoughts of her, he knew well enough that behind her small, delicate personality there was a powerful intellectual lens, so to speak, through which she examined the ins and outs of character in man or woman, and he felt that he was always more or less under this lens, looked at as carefully as a scientist might study bacteria, and that as a matter of fact it was as unlikely as the descent of the moon goddess to Endymion that she would ever submit herself to his possession. Nevertheless, he argued, stranger things had happened. The grey peep of dawn widened into a silver rift, and the silver rift streamed into a bar of gold, and the bar of gold broke up into long strands of blush pink and pale blue, like festal banners hanging in heaven's bright pavilion. And the white eagle flew on swiftly, steadily, securely, among all the glories of the dawn, like a winged car for the conveyance of angels. And both Rivardi and Gaspard thought they were not far from the realisation of an angel, when Morgana suddenly appeared at the door of her sleeping cabin, attired in a fleecy wool gown of purest white, her wonderful gold hair unbound and falling nearly to her feet. "'What a perfect morning!' she exclaimed. "'All things seem new, and I have had such a good rest. The air is so pure and clean.' Surely we are over the sea. We are some fifteen thousand feet above the Mediterranean, answered Rivardi, looking at her as he spoke with unconcealed admiration. Never, he thought, had she seemed so charming, youthful, and entirely lovable. I am glad you have rested. You look quite refreshed and radiant. After all, it is a test of endurance, this journey to Egypt and back. Do you think so? and Morgana smiled. It should be nothing. It really is nothing. We ought to be quite ready and willing to travel like this for a week on end. But you and Gaspard are not yet absolutely sure of our motive power. You cannot realise that as long as we keep going so long will our going force be generated without effort. Yet surely it is proved. Gaspard lifted his eyes towards her, 
where she stood like a little white Madonna in a shrine. Yes, Madame, it is proved, he said, but the secret of its proving? Ah, that, for the present, remains locked up in the mystery box here, and she tapped her forehead with her finger. The world is not ready for it. The world is a destructive savage, loving evil rather than good, and it will work mischief more than usefulness with such a force, if it knew. Now I will dress and give you breakfast in ten minutes. She waved a hand to them and disappeared, returning after a brief interval attired in her aviation costume and cap. Soon she had prepared quite a tempting breakfast on the table. Thermos coffee, she said gaily, all hot and hot. We could have had thermos tea, but I think coffee more inspiriting. Tea always reminds me of an afternoon at a country vicarage where good ladies sit round a table and talk of babies and rheumatism. Kind, but so dull. Come, you must take it in turns. You, Marcusse, first, while Gaspard steers. And Gaspard next, just as you did last night, at what we called dinner, before you fell asleep. Men do fall asleep after dinner, you know. It's quite ordinary, married men especially. I think they do it to avoid conversation with their wives. She laughed, and her eyes flashed mirthfully, as Rivardi seated himself opposite to her at the table. Well, I am not married, he said rather petulantly, nor is Gaspard, but some day we may fall into temptation and not be delivered from evil. Ah, yes. And Morgana shook her fair head at him with mock dolefulness. And that will be very sad, though nowadays it will not bind you to a fettered existence. Marriage has ceased to be a sacrament. You can leave your wives as soon as you get tired of them, or they can leave you. Rivardi looked at her with reproach in his handsome face and dark eyes. You read the modern press, he said. A pity you do. Yes, it is a pity anyone reads it, she answered. But what are we to read? If low-minded and illiterate scavengers are employed to write for the newspapers instead of well-educated men, we must put up with the mud the scavengers collect. We know well enough that every journal is more or less a calendar of lies. All the same, we cannot blind ourselves to the great change that has come over manners and morals particularly in relation to marriage. Of course, the press always chronicles the worst items bearing on the subject. The press is chiefly to blame for it, declared Rivardi. Oh, I think not. And Morgana smiled as she poured out a second cup of coffee. The press cannot create a new universe. No, I think human nature alone is to blame, if blame there be. Human nature is tired. Tired? echoed Rivardi. In what way? In every way. And a lovely light of tenderest pity filled her eyes as she spoke. Tired of the same old round of working, mating, breeding and dying, for no results really worth having. Civilization after civilization has arisen, always with strife and difficulty, only to pass away, leaving, in many cases, scarce a memory. Human nature begins to weary of the continuous grind. It demands the why of its ceaseless labour. Latterly, poor striving men and women have been deprived of faith. They used to believe they had a loving father in heaven who cared for them. But the monkeys of the race, the atheists, swinging from point to point of argument and chattering all the time, have persuaded them that they are, as Tennyson once mournfully wrote, poor orphans of nothing, alone on that lonely shore, born of the brainless nature who knew not that which she bore. Can we wonder, then, that they are tired, tired of pursuing a useless quest? Human nature is craving for a change, for a newer world, a newer race. And those who see that nature is not brainless but full of intelligent conception, assure that the change will come. 
and you are one of those who see, said Rivardi incredulously. I do not say I am. That would be too much self-assertion, she answered. But I hope I am. I long to see the world endowed more richly with health and happiness. See how gloriously the sun has risen. In what splendour of light and air we are sailing. If we can do as much as this, we ought to be able to do more. We shall do more in time, he said. The advance of one step leads to another. In time, echoed Morgana. What time the human race has already taken to find out the simplest forces of nature. It is the horrible bulk of blank stupidity that hinders knowledge, the heavy obstinate bulk that declines to budge an inch out of its own fixity. Nowadays we triumph in our so-called discoveries of wireless telegraphy and telephony, light rays and other marvels. But these powers have always been with us, from the beginning of things. It is we, we only, who have refused to accept them as facts of the universe. Let us talk no more about it. Stupidity is the only thing that moves me to despair. She rose from the little table and called Gaspard to breakfast, while Rivardi went back to the business of steering. The day was now fully declared, and the great airship soared easily in a realm of ethereal blue, blue above, blue below, its vast wings moving up and down with perfect rhythm, as if it were a living sentient creature, reveling in the joys of flight. For the rest of the day, Morgana was very silent, contenting herself to sit in her charming little rose-lined nest of a room and read, now and then looking out on the radiating space around her and watching for the first slight downward movement of the white eagle towards land. She had plenty to occupy her thoughts, and strange to say, she did not consider as anything unexpected or remarkable her brief communication with the brazen city. On the contrary, it seemed quite a natural happening. Of course it had always been there, she said to herself. Only people were too dull and unenterprising to discover it. Besides, if they had ever found it, certain travellers having declared they had seen it in the distance, they would not have been allowed to approach it. This fact was the one point that chiefly dwelt in her mind the secret of science which she puzzled her brain to fathom. What could be the unseen force that guarded the city, girding it round with an unbreakable band from all exterior attack? A million bombs could not penetrate it. So had said the voice travelling to her ears on the mysterious sound ray. She thought of Shakespeare's lines on England. This precious stone set in the silver sea which serves it in the office of a wall, or as a moat defensive to a house, against the envy of less happy lands. Modern science had made the sea useless as a wall or moat defensive against attacks from the air. But if there existed an atmospheric or etheric force, which could be utilised and brought to such pressure as to encircle a city or a country with a protective ring that should resist all effort to break it, how great a security would be assured against the envy of less happy lands. Here was a problem for study, study of the intricate character which she loved, and she became absorbed in what she called thinking for results, a form of introspection which she knew from experience sometimes let in unexpected light on the creative cells of the brain and impelled them to the evolving of hitherto untried suggestions. She sat quietly with a book before her, not reading, but bent on seeking ways and means for the safety and protection of nations, as bent as Roger Seaton was on a force for their destruction. So the hours passed swiftly, and no interruption or untoward obstacle hindered the progress of the white eagle as it careered through the halcyon blue of the calmest, loveliest sky that ever made perfect weather, till late afternoon when it began to glide almost insensibly downward toward earth. Then she roused herself 
from her long abstraction and looked through the window of her cabin, watching what seemed to be the gradual rising of the land towards the airship, showing in little green and brown patches, like the squares of a chessboard, then the houses and towns, tiny as children's toys, then the azure gleam of the sea, and the boats dancing like bits of cork upon it, then finally the plainer, broader view, wherein the earth with its woods and hills and rocky promontories appeared to heave up like a billowed crown with varying colours, and so steadily, easily down to the pattern of grass and flowers, from the centre of which the Palazzo d'Oro rose like a little white house for the abode of fairies. Well steered, said Morgana, as the ship ran into its shed with the accuracy of a sword slipping into its sheath, and the soundless vibration of its mysterious motive power ceased. Home again safely, and only away forty-eight hours, to the Sahara and back. How far we have been, and what we have seen. We have seen nothing, said Rivardi meaningly, as he assisted her to alight. The seeing is all within you. And the believing, she answered, smiling. All my thanks to you both for your skilful pilotage. You must be very tired. Here she gave her hand to each of them in turn. Again, a thousand thanks. No airship could be better manned. Or womaned, suggested Rivardi. She laughed. If you like. But I only steered while you slept. That is nothing. Good night. She left them, running up the garden path lightly like a child, returning from a holiday, and disappeared. But that which she calls nothing, said Gaspard as he watched her go, is everything. End of chapter 19「Of the Secret Power. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Secret Power by Marie Corelli. Chapter 20. For some days after her adventurous voyage to the great desert and back, Morgana chose to remain in absolute seclusion. Save for Lady Kingswood and her own household staff, she saw no one, and was not accessible even to Don Eliseus, who called several times, moved not only by interest, but genuine curiosity to inquire how she fared. Many of the residents in the vicinity of the Palazzo d'Oro had gleaned scraps of information here and there concerning the wonderful airship which they had seen careening over their heads during its testing trials and as a matter of course they had heard more than scraps in regard to its wealthy owner. But nowadays, keen desire to know and to investigate has given place to a sort of civil apathy which passes for good form, that absolute indifferentism which is too much bored to care about other people's affairs, and which would not disturb itself if it heard a neighbor deciding to cross the Atlantic in a wash-tub. Nothing matters is the general verdict on all events and circumstances. Nevertheless, the size, the swiftness, and soundlessness of the white eagle, and the secrecy observed in its making, had somewhat moved the heavy lump of human dough called society, and the whispered novelty of Morgana's invention had reached Rome and Paris, nay, almost London, without her consent or knowledge, so that she was more or less deluged with letters, and noted scientists, both in France and Italy, though all incredulous as to her attainment, made it a point of business to learn all they could about her, which was not much more than can be usually learned about any wealthy woman or man with a few whims to gratify. A murderer gains access to the whole press. His look, his manner, his remarks are all carefully noted and commented upon. But a scientist, an explorer, a man or woman whose work is that of beneficence and use to humanity, is barely mentioned except in the way of a sneer. So it often chances that the public know nothing of its greatest, till they have passed beyond the reach of worldly honour. Morgana, however, had no desire that her knowledge or attainment should be admired or praised. She was entirely destitute of ambition. She had read too much and studied too deeply to care for so-called fame, 
which, as she knew, is the mere noise of one moment, to be lost in silence the next. She was self-centered, and yet not selfish. She felt that to understand her own entity, its mental and physical composition, and the possibilities of its future development, was sufficient to fill her life, that life which she quite instinctively recognized as bearing within itself the seed of immortality. Her strange interview with the voice from the city in the desert, and the glimpse she had been permitted to see of the owner of that voice, had not so much surprised her as convinced her of a theory she had long held, namely that there were other types of the human race existing, unknown to the generality of ordinary men and women, types that were higher in their organization and mental capacity, types which by reason of their very advancement kept themselves hidden and aloof from modern civilization, and she forthwith plunged anew into the ocean of scientific problems, where she floated like a strong swimmer at ease with her mind upturned to the stars. Yet she did not neglect the graceful comforts and elegancies of the Palazzo d'Oro, and life went on in that charming abode peacefully. Morgana, always being the kindest of patrons to Lady Kingswood, and discoursing feminine commonplaces with her as though there were no other subjects of conversation in the world than embroidery and specific cures for rheumatism. She said little, indeed almost nothing, of her aerial voyage to the east, except that she had enjoyed it, and that the pyramids and the sphinx were dwarfed into mere insignificant dots on the land, as seen from the air. She had apparently nothing more to describe, and Lady Kingswood was not sufficiently interested in air travel to press inquiry. One bright sunny morning, after a week of her self-imposed seclusion, she announced her intention of calling at the monastery to see Don Alicius. "'I have been rather rude,' she said. "'Of course he has wanted to know how my flight to the east went off, and I have given no sign, and sent no message. He has called several times, replied Lady Kingswood, and I think he has been very much disappointed not to be received. Poor Reverend Father, and Morgana smiled. He should not bother his mind about a woman. Well, I'm going to see him now. Lady Kingswood looked at her critically. She was gowned in a simple white morning frock with touches of blue, and she wore a broad-brimmed Tuscan straw hat with a fold of blue carelessly twined about it. She made a pretty picture, one of extraordinary youthfulness for any woman out of her teens, so much so that Lady Kingswood wondered if voyages in the air would be found to have a rejuvenating effect. They do not admit women into the actual monastery, she went on. Feminine frivolities are forbidden. But the ruined cloister is open to visitors, and I shall ask to see Don Alicius there. She lightly waved adieu and went leaving her amiable and contented chaperone to the soothing companionship of a strip of embroidery at which she worked with the leisurely tranquillity which such an occupation engenders. The ruined cloister looked very beautiful that morning, with its crumbling arches crowned and festooned with roses climbing every way at their own sweet will, and Morgana's light figure gave just a touch of human interest to the solemn peacefulness of the scene. She waited but two or three minutes before Don Alicius appeared, he had seen her arrive from the window of his own private library. He approached her slowly. There was a gravity in the expression of his face that almost amounted to coldness, and no smile lightened it as she met his keen, fixed glance. "'So you have come at last,' he said. "'I have not merited your confidences till now. Why?' His rich voice had a ring of deep reproach in its tone, and she was for a moment taken aback. Then her native self-possession and perfect assurance returned. "'Dear Father Alicius, you do not want my confidence. You know all I can tell you,' she said, and drawing close to him, she laid her hand on his arm. "'Am I not right?' A tremor shook him. Gently he put her hand aside. "'You think I know,' he replied. "'You imagine—' "'Oh, no, I imagine nothing,' and she smiled. "'I am sure, yes, sure, that you have the secret of things that seem fabulous, and yet are true.' It was you who first told me of the brazen city in the great desert. You said it was a mere tradition, but you filled my mind with a desire to find it. And you found it? he interrupted quickly. You found it? You know I did, she replied. Why ask the question? Messages on a sound ray can reach you as well as me. He moved to the stone bench which occupied a corner of the cloister and sat down. He was very pale, and his eyes were feverishly bright. Presently he seemed to recover himself, and spoke more in his usual manner. 
Rivardi has been here every day, he said. He has talked of nothing but you. He told me that he and Gaspard fell suddenly asleep, for which they were grievously ashamed of themselves, and that you took control of the airship and turned it homeward before you had given them any chance to explore the desert. Quite true, she answered tranquilly. And you knew all that before he told you. You knew that I was compelled to turn the ship homeward because it was not allowed to proceed. Dear Father Alicius, you cannot hide yourself from me. You are one of the few who has studied the secrets of the approaching future, the change which is imminent, the world to come which is coming. Yes, and you are brave to live as you do in the fetters of a conventional faith, when you have had such a far wider outlook. He stopped her by a gesture, rising from where he sat, and extending a hand of warning and authority. Child, beware what you say! and his voice had a ring of sternness in its mellow tone. If I know what you think I know, on what grounds do you suppose I have built my knowledge? Only on that faith which you call conventional, that faith which has never been understood by the world's majority, that faith which teaches of the God and man done to death by the man without God in him, and who, nevertheless, by the spiritual strength of a resurrection from the grave, proves that there is no death but only continuous renewal of life, this is no mere convention of faith, no imaginary or traditional tale. It is a pure scientific fact. The virginal conception of divinity in women, and the transfiguration of manhood, these things are true, and the advance of scientific discovery will prove them so beyond all denial. We have held the faith, as it should be held, for centuries, and it has led us, and continues to lead us, to all we know. We? queried Morgana softly. We? of the church, or of the brazen city? He looked at her for some moments without speaking. His tall, fine figure seemed more than ever stately and imposing, and his features expressed a calm assurance and the dignity of thought which gave them additional charm. Your question is bold, he said. Your enterprising spirit stops at nothing. You have learned much. You are resolved to learn more. Well, I cannot prevent you, nor do I see any reason why I should try. You are a resolved student. You are also a woman. A woman different to ordinary women and set apart from ordinary womanhood. So I say to you, we of the brazen city, if you will. For more than three thousand years we have existed. We have studied. We have discovered. We have known. We, the selected offspring of all the race that ever were born. We, the pure blood of the earth. We, the progenitors of the world to be. We have lived, watching temporary civilizations rise and fall, seeing generations born and die, because, like weeds, they have grown without any root of purpose, save to smother their neighbors and destroy. We remain as commanded, waiting for the full declaration and culmination of those forces which are already advancing to the end, when the kingdom comes. Morgana moved close to him, and looked up at his grave, dark face beseechingly. Then why are you here? she asked. If you know, if you were ever in the brazen city, how did it happen that you left it? How could it happen? He smiled down into the jewel blue of her clear eyes. Little child, he said, brilliant soul that rejoiced in the perception that gave you what you called the inside of a sun ray, you for whom the things which interest men and women of the moment are mere toys of poor invention. You, of all others, ought to know that when the laws of the universe are understood and followed, there can be no fetters on the true liberty of the subject. If I were ever in the brazen city, mind I say if, there could be nothing to prevent my leaving it if I chose. She interrupted him by the uplifting of a hand. I was told, she said slowly, by a voice that spoke to me, that if I went there, I should have to stay there. No doubt, he answered. For love would keep you. Love? she echoed. Even so, such love as you have never dreamed of, dear soul weighted with millions of gold. Love, the only force that pulls heaven to earth and binds them together. But you, you, if you were in the brazen city. If, he repeated emphatically. If, yes, if, she said. If you were there, love did not hold you. No. There was a silence. 
the sunshine burned down on the ancient grey flagstones of the cloister, and two gorgeous butterflies danced over the climbing roses that hung from the arches in festal wreaths of pink and white. A luminance deeper than that of the sun seemed to encircle the figures standing together, the one so elfin, light, and delicate, the other invested with a kind of inward royalty, expressing itself outwardly in stateliness of look and bearing. Something mysteriously suggestive of superhumanity environed them, a spirit and personality higher than mortal. After some minutes, Olysia spoke again. The city is not a brazen city, he said. It has been called so by travellers who have seen its golden towers glistening afar off in a sudden refraction of the light lasting but a few seconds. Gold often looks like brass, and brass like gold, in human entities as in architectural results. He paused, then went on slowly and impressively. Surely you remember, you must remember, that it is written, The city lieth four square, and the length is as large as the breadth. The wall thereof is according to the measure of a man, that is, of the angel, and the city is of pure gold. Does that give you no hint of the measure of a man, that is, of the angel, of the new heavens and the new earth, the old things being passed away? Dear child, you have studied deeply, you have adventured far and greatly. Continue your quest, but do not forget to take your guiding light the faith which half the world and more ignores. She sprang to him impulsively and caught his hands. Oh, you must help me, she cried. You must teach me. I want to know what you know. He held her gently and with reverent tenderness. I know no more than you, he answered. You work by science. I, by faith, the bedrock from which all science proceeds. And we arrive at the same discoveries by different methods. I am a poor priest in the temple of the divine, serving my turn. But I am not alone in service, for in every corner of the habitable globe there is one member of our city who communicates with the rest. One. But enough. Today's commercial world uses old systems of wireless telegraphy and telephony which were known and done with thousands of years ago. But we have the sound ray, the light which carries music on its wings and creates form as it goes. Here he released her hands. Knowing what you do know, you have no need of my help, he continued. You have not found happiness yet, because that only comes through one source, love. But I doubt not that God will give you that in his own good time. He paused, and then went on. As you go out, enter the chapel for a moment, and send a prayer on the sound ray to the center of all knowledge, the source of all discovery. Have no fear but that it will arrive. The rest is for you to decide. She hesitated. And the brazen city? she queried. The golden city, he answered. Well, you have had your experience. Your name is known there, and no doubt you can hear from it when you will. Do you hear from it? she asked pointedly. He smiled gravely. I may not speak of what I hear, he answered, nor may you. She was silent for a space, then looked up at him appealingly. The world has changed for me, she said. It will never be the same again. I do not seem to belong to it. Other influences surround me. How I live in it? How shall I work? What shall I do? You will do as you have always done. Go your own way, he replied. The way which has led you to so much discovery and attainment. You must surely know in your own soul that you have been guided in that way, and your success is the result of allowing yourself to be guided. In all things you will be guided now. Have no fear for yourself. All will be well for you. And for you? she asked impulsively. He smiled. Why think of me? he said gently. I am nothing in your life. You are, she replied. You are more than you can imagine. I begin to realize... He held up his hand with a warning gesture. Hush, he said. There are things of which we must not speak. At that moment the monastery bell tolled the midday Angelus. Don Aloysius bent his head. Morgana instinctively did the same. Within the building the deep voices of the brethren sounded, chanting, Angelus Domini Nuntiavet Maria, et concepit Spiritus Sancto. 
as the salutation to heaven finished, the mellow music of the organ in the chapel sent a wave of solemn and prayerful tenderness on the air, and, moved by the emotion of the hour, Morgana's heart beat more quickly, and tears filled her eyes. "'There must be beautiful music in the Golden City,' she said. Don Aloysius smiled. "'There is. And when the other things of life give you pause to listen, you will often hear it.' She smiled happily in response, and then, with a silent gesture of farewell, left the cloister and made her way to the chapel, part of which was kept open for public worship. It was empty, but the hidden organist was still playing. She went towards the high altar and knelt in front of it. She was not of the Catholic faith. She was truly of no faith at all save that which is taught by science, which, like a door opened in heaven, shows all the wonders within. But her keen sense of the beautiful was stirred by the solemn peace of the shut tabernacle with a cross above it, and the great lilies bending under their own weight of loveliness and fragrance from either side. It is the symbol of a great truth which is true for all time, she thought as she clasped her hands in an attitude of prayer. And how sad and strange it is to feel that there are thousands among the best-intentioned worshippers and priests who have not discovered its mystic meaning. The God and man, born of purity and woman. Is it only in the golden city that they know? She raised her eyes in half-unconscious appeal and as she did so, a brilliant ray of light flashed downward from the summit of the cross which surmounted the altar and remained extended slantwise toward her. She saw it, and waited expectantly. Close to her ears a voice spoke with extreme softness, yet very distinctly. "'Can you hear me?' "'Yes,' she replied at once, with equal softness. "'Then listen. I have a message for you.' And Morgana listened, listened intently, the sapphire hue of the ray lighting her gold hair as she knelt absorbed. What she heard filled her with a certain dread, and a tremor of premonition, like the darkness preceding storm, shook her nerves. But the inward spirit of her was as a warrior clothed in steel. She was afraid of nothing, least of all of any event or incident passing for supernatural, knowing beyond all doubt that the most seeming miraculous circumstances are all the result of natural movement and transmutation. There never has been anything surprising to her in the fact that light is a conveyor of sound, and that she was receiving a message by such means seemed no more extraordinary to her mind than receiving it by the accepted telephonic service. Every word spoken she heard with the closest attention, until, as though a cloud had suddenly covered it, the sound ray vanished, and the voice ceased. She rose at once from her knees, alert and ready for action. Her face was pale, her lips set, her eyes luminous. I must not hesitate, she said. If I can save him, I will. She left the chapel and hurried home, where as soon as she reached her own private room, she wrote to the Marchesa Rivardi the following note, which was more than unpleasantly startling to him when he received it. I shall need you and Gaspard for a long journey in the White Eagle. Prepare everything in the way of provisioning and other necessary details. No time must be lost, and no expense need be spared. We must start as quickly as possible. This message, written, sealed, and dispatched by one of her servants to the Marchesa's villa, she sat for some moments lost in thought, wistfully looking out on her flower-filled gardens and the shimmering blue of the Mediterranean beyond. "'I may be too late,' she said, speaking aloud to herself. "'But I will take the risk. He will not care, no, a man like that cares for nothing but himself. He would have broken my life, had I given him the chance, for the sake of an experiment. Now, if I can, I will rescue him for the sake of an ideal. End of chapter 20 Recording by Todd Chapter 21 of The Secret Power This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Lena Emsley the Secret Power by Marie Corelli Chapter 21 There shall be no more wars. There can be none. Roger Seaton said these words aloud with defiant emphasis, addressing the dumb sky. It was early morning, but an intense heat had so scorched the earth that not the smallest drop of dew glittered on any leaf or blade of grass. It was all arid brown and burned into a dryness as of fever. 
but Seaton was far too much engrossed with himself and his own business to note the landscape, or to be troubled by the suffocating closeness of the atmosphere. He stood, gazing with the idolatry of a passionate lover, at a small, plain metal case, containing a dozen or more small, plain metal cylinders, as small as women's thimbles, all neatly ranged side by side, divided from contact with one another by folded strips of cotton. There it is, he went on, apostrophizing the still air. Complete, perfected. If I sold that to any nation under the sun, that nation could rule the world, could wipe out everything save itself and its own people. I have wrested the secret from the very womb of nature. It is mine, all mine. I would have given it to Britain, or to the United States, but neither will accept my terms. So therefore I hold it, I only. Which is just as well. I, just I, am master of destiny. The power we call God has put this tiling into my hands. What a marvel! And shall I not use it? I will. Let Germany but stir an inch towards aggression, and Germany shall exist no longer. The same with any other nation that starts a quarrel. I, I alone, will settle it. His eyes blazed with the light of fanaticism. He was obsessed by the force of his own ideas and schemes, and the metal case on the table before him was, to his mind, time, life, present and future. He had arrived at that questionable point of intellectual attainment when man forgets that there is any existing force capable of opposing him, and imagines that he is but to go on his own way to grasp all worlds and secrets of their being. At this juncture, so often arrived at by many, a kind of super-sureness sets in, persuading the finite nature that it has reached the infinite. The whole mental organization of the man thrilled with an awful consciousness of power. He said within himself, I hold the lives of millions at my mercy. Other thoughts, other dreams had passed away for the moment. He had forgotten life as it presents itself to the ordinary human being. Now and again a flitting vision of Morgana vaguely troubled him. Her intellectual capacity annoyed him, and yet he would have been glad to discuss with her the scientific unfolding of his great secret. She would understand it, in all its bearings. She might advise. Advice? No, he did not need the advice of a woman. As for Manella, he had not seen her since the last violent outburst of what he called temper, and he had no wish for her presence. For now he had a thing to do which was of paramount importance, and this was to deposit the treasured discovery of his life in a secret hiding place he had found for it, till he should be ready to remove it to safer quarters, or till he resolved to use it. Had he been a religious man, of such humility as should accompany true religion, he would have prayed that its use should never be called upon. But he had trained himself into an attitude of such complete indifferentism towards life and the things of life, that to him it seemed useless to pray for what did not matter. Sometimes the thought, appalling in its truth, flashed across his brain that the force he had discovered and condensed within small compass might as easily destroy half the world as a nation. The fabled thunderbolts of Jove were child's play compared to those plain-looking thimble-like cylinders which contained such terrific power. A touch of hesitation, a pure human dread affected his nerves for the moment. He shivered in the sultry air as with cold, and looked about him right and left as though suspecting some hidden witness of his actions. There was not so much as a bird or a butterfly in sight, and he drew a long, deep breath of relief. The day was treading in the steps of dawn with the full blazonry of burning Californian sunlight, and away in the distance ridges and peaks of distant mountains stood out sharply clear against the intense blue of the sky. There was a great stillness everywhere, a pause, as it seemed, in the mechanism of the universe. The twitter of a bird or the cry of some wild animal would have been a relief, 
so Seaton felt, though accustomed to deep silence. "'Better get through with this at once,' he said aloud. "'Now that a safe place is prepared,' here he looked at his watch, "'in a couple of hours they'll be sending up from the plaza to know if I want anything. Irish Jake or Manella will be coming on some trivial matter. I'd better take the opportunity of complete secrecy while I can.' For the next few minutes or so he hesitated. With a sudden fancy that he had forgotten something, he turned out his pockets, looking for he scarcely knew what. The contents were mixed and various, and among them was a crumpled letter which he had received some days since from Sam Gwent. He smoothed it out carefully and re-read it, especially one passage. "'I think the States will never get involved in another war, but I'm fairly sure Germany will. If she joins up with Russia, look out for squalls. In your old country, which appears to be peopled by madmen, there's a riding chap who spent a fortnight in Russia, not long enough to know the ins and outs of a village, yet assuming to know everything about the biggest territory in Europe. And the press is puffing up his ignorance as if it were wisdom. Germany has her finger on the spot, so perhaps your stuff will come in useful. But don't forget that if you make up your mind to use it, you will ruin America, commercially speaking, and many other countries besides. So think it well over, more than a hundred times. Lydia Herbert, whom perhaps you remember, and perhaps you don't, has caught her ancient mariner, that is to say, her millionaire, and all fashionable New York is going to the wedding, including yours truly. I had expected Morgana Royal to grace the function, but I hear she is quite engrossed with the decoration and furnishing of her Sicilian palace, as well as that of her advising artist, a very good-looking Marquis, or Marquesser, as he is called. It is also whispered that she has invented a wonderful airship, which has no engines, and creates its own motive power as it goes. Sounds rather tall talk, but this is an age of wonders and we never know what next. There is a new light ray just out which prospects for gold, oil, and all ores and minerals, and finds them in a fifty-mile circuit, so probably nobody need be poor for the future. When we've all got most things we want and there's nothing left to work for, I wonder what the world will be worth. Seaton left off reading and thrust the letter again in his pocket. What will the world be worth? he soliloquized. Why, nothing. Suddenly struck by this thought, which had not always presented itself with such sharp and clear precision as now, he took time to consider it. Capital and labour, the two forces which are much more prone to rend each other than to cooperate, these would both possibly be non-existent if science had its full way, if gold, silver and other precious minerals could be picked up, as on the fabled Tom Tiddler's ground, by a ray of light, then the striving for wealth would cease, and work would be reduced to a minimum. The prospect was stupendous, but hardly entirely pleasing. If there were no need for effort, then the powers of mind and body would sink into inertia. What object should we live for? he mused. Merely to propagate our own kind and bring more effortless beings into our world to cumber it? The very idea is horrible. Work is the very blood and bone of existence. Without it we should rot but one must work for something, or someone. Wife? Children? Useless labour, for in nine cases out often the wife becomes a bore, and the children grow up ungrateful. Why waste strength and feeling on either? Thus mentally arguing, the exquisite lines of Tennyson's Lotus Eaters suddenly rang in his memory like a chime of bells from the old English village where he had lived as a boy, when his mother, one of the past sweet old-fashioned women used to read to him and to teach him much of the best in literature death is the end of life ah oh, why should life or labour be let us alone time driveth onward fast and in a little while our lips are dumb let us alone what is it that will last all things are taken from us and become portions and parcels of the dreadful past let us alone. What pleasure can we have to war with evil? Is there any peace in ever climbing up the climbing wave? 
an effortless existence would be the existence of such as these fabled lotus-eaters. Moreover, it was not possible it could go on, since all nature shows effort without cessation. Roger Seaton knew this as all know it, but his soul's demand remained unsatisfied, for he sought to know the cause of all the toil and trouble, the why it should be. And at the back of his mind there was ever a teasing reminder of Morgana and her strange theories, some of which she had half imparted to him when their friendship had first begun. For her, Tennyson's line, Death is the end of life, would be the statement of a foolish fallacy, as she held that there is no such thing as death, only failure to adapt the spirit to advancing and higher change in its physical organization. Today, he remembered with curious clearness what she had said on this subject. Radioactivity is the chief secret of life. It is for us to learn how to absorb it into our systems as we grow, to add by its means to our supplies of vitality and energy. It never gives out, nor should we. The nature intention is that we should become better, stronger, more beautiful, more mentally and spiritually perfect and that we do not fulfil this intention is our own fault. The decimation of the human race by wars and plagues and famines has always been traceable to human error. All accidents happen through those who make accidents possible. Diseases are bred through human dirt, greed, ignorance and neglect. They are no part of the divine scheme of things. The plan is to advance and make progress from one point of excellence to another, not to stop halfway and turn back on the road. Humanity dies because it will not learn how to live. She had spoken these words with a quiet simplicity and earnestness that impressed him at the time as being almost childlike, considering the depth of thought into which he must have plunged, notwithstanding her youth and her sex. And on this morning of all others, this morning, on which he had set himself a task for which he had made long and considerable preparation, he found himself half mechanically repeating her phrase, Humanity dies because it will not learn how to live. There was no fatalism, no fixed destiny in this, only the force of will was implied, the will to learn, the will to know. And why should not humanity die, he argued within himself. If, in the long course of ages, it is proved that it will neither learn nor know, why should it remain? Room should be made for a new race. A clever gardener can produce a perfectly beautiful flower from an insignificant and common weed. Surely this is a lesson to us that it may be possible to produce a god from a man. He bent his eyes lovingly on the case of small cylinders lying open before him. The just-risen sun brightened them to a glitter as of cold steel, and for a moment he fancied they flashed upon him with an almost sinister gleam. "'Power of good or power of evil?' he questioned his inward spirit. "'Who can decide? If it is good to destroy evil, then the force is a good force. If it is evil to destroy good with evil, then it is an evil thing. But nature makes no such particular discriminations. She destroys evil and good together at one blow. Why, therefore, should I, or any one, offer to discriminate, since evil is always the preponderating factor? When the Lusitania was torpedoed, neither God nor nature interfered to save the innocent from the guilty. Men, women, and children were all plunged into the pitiless sea. I, as part of nature, if I destroy, I only follow her example. War is an evil an abominable crime, and those that attempt to make it should be swept from the face of the earth, even if good and peace-loving units are swept along with them. This cannot be helped. He went into his hut, and in a few minutes came out again clothed in thick garments of a dark earth colour, and carrying a stout staff, steel pointed at its end, something after the fashion of a Swiss alpenstock. He brought with him a small metal box, into which he placed the case of cylinders covering it with a closely fitting lid. Then he put the package into a basket made of rough twigs and strips of bark, having a strong handle to which he fastened a leather strap, and slung the whole thing over his shoulders like a knapsack. Then, casting another look round to make sure that there was no one about, 
he started to walk towards a steeper descent of the hill in a totally different direction from that which led to the plaza hotel he went swiftly at a steady swinging pace and though his way took him among confused masses of rocks and fallen boulders he thought nothing of these obstacles vaulting lightly across them with the ease of a chamois till he came to a point where there was a declivity running sheer down to invisible depths from whence came the rumbling echo of falling water in this almost perpendicular wall of rock were a few ledges like the precarious rungs of a broken ladder and down these he prepared to go clinging at first to the topmost edge of the precipice he let himself down warily inch by inch till his figure entirely disappeared sunken as it were in darkness as he vanished there was a sudden cry a rush as of wings and a woman sprang up from amid bushes where she had lain hidden it was manella for days and nights she had stolen away in the intervals of her work to watch him and nothing had chanced to excite her alarm till now till now when she had seen him emerge from his hut and pack up the mysterious box he carried and when she had heard him talking strangely to himself in a way she could not understand as soon as he started to walk she followed him pushing through heavy brushwood and crawling along the ground where she could not be seen and now with dishevelled hair and staring terrified eyes she leaned over the edge of the precipice baffled and desperate tearless sobs convulsed her throat oh god of mercy she moaned in suffocated accents how can i follow him down there oh help me mary mother help me i must i must be with him she gathered up her hair in a loose coil and wound her skirts tightly about her looking everywhere for a footing she saw a deep cranny which had been hollowed out by some torrent of water it cut sharply through the rock like a path she could risk that perhaps she thought and yet her brain reeled she felt sick and giddy would it not be wiser to stay where she was and wait for the return of the reckless creature who had ventured all alone into one of the deepest canons of the whole country while she hesitated she caught a sudden glimpse of him stepping with apparent ease over huge heaps of stones and fallen pieces of rock at the bottom of the declivity she watched his movements in breathless suspense on he went towards a vast aperture shaped archwise like the entrance to a cavern he paused a moment then entered it this was enough for manella her wild love and wilder terror gave her an almost supernatural strength and daring and all heedless now of results she sprang boldly towards the deep cutting in the rock swinging herself from jagged point to point till reaching the bottom of the declivity at last bruised and bleeding but undaunted she stopped checked by a rushing stream that tumbled over great boulders and dashed its cold spray in her face looking about her she saw to her dismay that the vaulted cavern wherein seaton had disappeared was on the other side of this stream she stood almost opposite to it but how to get across gazing despairingly in every direction she suddenly perceived the fallen trunk of a tree lying half in and half out of the brawling torrent it was green with slippery moss and offered but a dangerous foothold nevertheless she resolved to attempt it i said i would die for him she thought and i will getting astride the tree it swayed under her but she found she could push one of the larger boughs forward to lengthen the extemporary bridge and so as it were riding the waters which surged noisily around her she managed by dint of superhuman effort to reach the projection of pebbly shore where the entrance of the cavern yawned open before her black and desolate the sun in its full morning glory blazed slanting down upon the darkness of the cannon and as she stood shivering wet through and utterly exhausted wondering what next she should do she caught sight of a form moving within the cave like a moving shadow and ascending a steep natural stairway of columnar rocks piled one on top of the other affrighted as she was by the tomb-like aspect of the deep vault she had not ventured so far that she would now shrink from further dangers or fail in her quest 
the cherished object of her constant watchful care was within that subterranean blackness and for what purpose she did not dare to think but there was an instinctive sense of dread foreknowledge upon her a warning of impending evil and had she not sworn to him if god struck you down to hell i would be there the entrance to the cavern looked like the mouth of hell itself as she had seen it depicted in one of her catholic early lesson books there were serpents and dragons in the picture ready to devour the impenitent sinner there might be serpents and dragons in this cave for all she knew but what matter if the man she loved were actually in hell she would be there as she had said and would surely find it heaven and so seeing the mere outline of his form moving ghost-like in the gloom it was to her a guiding presence a light amid darkness and when after a minute or two her straining eyes perceived him climbing steadily up the steep and perilous rocks seeming about to disappear altogether she mastered the tremor of her nerves and crept cautiously step by step into the sombre vault blindly feeling her way through the damp thick murkiness reckless of all danger and only bent on following him end of chapter 21「XXII of the Secret Power. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lena Emsley. The Secret Power by Marie Corelli. Chapter 22. Of all the vagaries and humours of humanity, when considered in crowds, there is nothing which appears more senseless and objectless than the way in which it congregates outside the door of a church at a fashionable or society wedding the massed people pushing and shoving each other about have nothing whatever to do with either bride or bridegroom the ceremony inside the sacred edifice has in most cases ceased to be a sacrament and has become a mere show of dressed-up mannequins and womenkins many of the latter being mere objets d'art stands for the display of millinery and yet the crowds fight and jostle women scramble and scream all to catch a glimpse of the woman who is to be given to the man and the man who has agreed to accept the woman the wealthier the pair the wilder the frenzy to gaze upon them savages performing a crazy war dance are decorous of behaviour in contrast with these civilised folk who tramp on each other's feet and are ready to squeeze each other into pulp for the chance of staring at two persons whom the majority of them have never seen before and are not likely to see again the wedding of miss lydia herbert with her ancient mariner a seventy-year-old millionaire reputed to be as wealthy as rockefeller was one of these sensations chiefly on account of the fact that every unmarried woman young and old and every widow had been hunting him in vain for fully five years miss herbert had been voted no chance because she made no secret of her extravagant tastes in dress and jewels yet despite society croakers she had won the game this in itself was interesting as the millionaire she had secured was known to be particularly close-fisted and parsimonious nevertheless he had shown remarkable signs of relaxing these tendencies for he had literally showered jewels on his chosen bride leaving no door open for any complaint in that quarter her diamonds were the talk of new york and on the day of her wedding her gowns literally flashed like a firework with numerous dazzling points of light the voice that breathed o'er eden had little to do with the magnificence of her attire or with the brilliancy of the rose-wreathed bridesmaids young girls of specially selected beauty and elegance who were all more or less disappointed in failing to win the millionaire themselves for these youthful persons in their teens had social ambitions hidden in hearts harder than steel a good time of self-indulgence and luxury was all they sought for in life in fact 
they had no conception of any higher ideal. The millionaire himself, though old, maintained a fairly middle-aged appearance. He was a thin, wiry, well-preserved man, his wizened and furrowed countenance chiefly showing the marks of time's ploughshare. It would have been difficult to say why, out of all the feminine butterflies hovering around him, he had chosen Lydia Herbert. But he was a shrewd judge of character in his way, and he had decided that as she was not in her first youth, it would be more worth her while to conduct herself decorously as wife and housekeeper, and generally look after his health and comfort, than it would be for a less responsible woman. Then she had manner. Her appearance was attractive, and she wore her clothes well and stylishly. All this was enough for a man who wanted someone to attend to his house and entertain his friends, and he was perfectly satisfied with himself as he repeated after the clergyman the words, With my body I thee worship, and with all my worldly goods I thee endow, knowing that with his body he had never worshipped anything, and that the endowment of his worldly goods was strictly limited to certain settlements. He felt himself to be superior to his old bachelor friend Sam Gwent, who supported him as best man at the ceremony, and who, as he stood, stiffly upright in immaculate, afternoon visiting attire, among the restlessly swaying, semi-whispering throng, was all the time thinking of the dusky night gloom in the garden of the plaza, far away in California, and a beautiful face, set against the dark background of myrtle bushes, exhaling rich perfume. What a startling contrast she would make to these dolls of fashion, he thought. What a sensation she would make. There's not a woman here who can compare with her. If I were only a bit younger, I'd try my luck. Anyway, I'm younger than today's bridegroom. But she, Manella, would never look at any other man than Seaton, who doesn't care a rap for her or any other woman. Here his thoughts took another turn. No, he repeated inwardly, he doesn't care a rap for her or any other woman, except, perhaps, Morgana. And even if it were Morgana, it would be for himself and himself alone. While she... Ah, it would be a clever brain indeed that could worry out what she cares for. Nothing in this world, so far as I can see. Here the organ poured the rich strains of a soft and solemn prelude through the crowded church. The sacred part of the ceremony was over, and bride and bridegroom made their way to the vestry, there to sign the register in the presence of a selected group of friends. Sam Gwent was one of these, and though he had attended many such functions before, he was more curiously impressed than usual by the unctuous and bare-faced hypocrisy of the whole thing the smiling humbug of the officiating clergy, the affected delight of the society toadies fluttering like wasps round bride and bridegroom, as though they were sweet dishes specially for stinging insects to feed on. And in his mind he seemed to hear the warm, passionate voice of Manella in frank admission of her love for Seaton. It is good to love him, she had said. I am happy to love him. I only wish to serve him. This was primitive passion, the passion of primitive woman for her mate, whom she admitted to be stronger than herself, to whom she instinctively looked for shelter and protection, and round whose commanding force she sought to rear the lovely fabric of home. A state of feeling as far removed from the sentiments of modern women as the constellation of Orion is removed from Earth, and Sam Gwent's fragmentary reflections flitting through his brain were more serious, one might say more romantic, than the consideration of dollars, which usually occupied all his faculties. He had always thought that there was a good deal in life which he had missed, somehow, and which dollars could not purchase, and a certain irate contempt filled him for the man who, unlike himself, was in the prime of strength, and who, with all the glories of nature about him, 
and the love and beauty of an exquisite womanhood at his hand for possession, could nevertheless devote his energies to the science of destruction and the compassing of death without compunction on the lines Roger Seaton had laid down as the remedy against all war. The kindest thing to think of him is that he's not quite sane, Gwent mused. He has been obsessed by the horrible carnage of the Great War, and disgusted by the utter inefficiency of governments since the armistice, and this appalling invention of his is the result. The crashing chords of the bridal march from Lohengrin put an end to his thoughts for the moment. People began to crush and push out of church, or stand back on each other's toes to stare at the bride's diamonds, as she moved very slowly and gracefully down the aisle on the arm of her elderly husband. She certainly looked very well, and her smile suggested entire satisfaction with herself and the world. Press cameramen clambered about wherever they could find a footing to catch and perpetuate that smile, which when enlarged and reproduced in newspapers would depict the grinning dental display so much associated with Woodrow Wilson and the Prince of Wales, though more suggestive of a skull than anything else. Skulls invariably show their teeth, we know, but it has been left to the modern press cameraman to insist on the death grin in faces that yet live. The crowd outside the church was far denser than the crowd within, and the fighting and scrambling for points of view became terrific, especially when the wedding guests' motor cars began to make their way, with sundry hoots and snorts, through the densely packed mob. Women screamed, some fainted, but none thought of giving way to others, or retiring from the wild scene of contest. Gwent judged it wisest to remain within the church portal till the crowd should clear, and there, safely ensconced, he watched the maddened mass of foolish sightseers, all of whom had plainly left their daily avocations merely to stare at a man and a woman wedded, with whom, personally, they had nothing whatever to do. "'People talk about unemployment,' he mused. "'There is enough human material in this one street to make wealth for themselves and the whole community. Yet they are idle by their own choice. If they had anything to do, they wouldn't be here. He laughed grimly. The utter stodginess and stupidity of humanity en masse had of late struck him very forcibly, and he found every excuse for the so-called incapacity of governments, seeing the kind of folk they are called upon to govern. He realised, as we all who read history must do, that we are no worse and no better than the peoples of the past. We are just as hypocritical, fraudulent, deceptive and cruel as ever they were in legalised torture times, and just as ineradicably selfish. The pagans practise a religion which they did not truly believe in, and so do we. All through the ages God has been mocked, all through the ages divine vengeance has fallen on the mockers and the mockery. And after all, thought Gwent, Wars are as necessary as plagues to clear out a superabundant population. Only most unfortunately, nature adopts such recklessness in her methods that it most often happens that the best among us are taken and the worst left. I tried to impress this on Seton, whose system of destruction would involve the good as well as the bad. But these intellectual monsters of scientific appetite have no conscience and no sentiment. To prove their theories, they would annihilate a continent. Here, a sudden ugly rush of the crowd, dangerous to both life and limb, pushed him back against the church portal with the force of a tidal wave. It was not concerned with the bridal pair, who had already driven away in their automobile, nor with the wedding guests, who were following them to the great hotel where the bride's reception was held. It was caused by the wild dash of half a dozen or so unkempt men and boys who tore a passage for themselves through the swaying mob of sightseers, waving newspapers aloft, and shouting loudly with voices deep and shrill, clear and hoarse. Earthquake in California! Terrible loss of life! Thousands dead! Awful scenes! 
earthquake in California. People swayed again, then stopped in massed groups, some clutching at the newsboys as they ran, and buying the papers as fast as they could be sold, while all the time, above the muffled roar of the city, they sent their cries aloft, echoing near and far. Thousands dead! Awful scenes! Towns destroyed! Terrible earthquake in California! Sam Gwent stepped out from the church portal, elbowing his way through the confusion. The yells of the news vendors rang sharply in his ears, and yet, for the moment, he scarcely grasped their meaning. California was the one word that caught him, as it were, with a hammer stroke. Then, thousands dead. Finding at last an open passage through the dispersing crowd, he went at something of a run after one of the newsboys, and snatched the last paper he had to sell out of his hand. "'What is it?' he demanded as he paid his money. "'Dunno,' the boy replied, breathlessly. "'Spect everybody's dead down California way!' Gwent unfolded the journal and stared at the great headlines, printed in fat black letters, still smelling strongly of printer's ink. Appalling earthquake in California. Mountain upheaval. Towns wiped out. Plaza Hotel engulfed. Frightful loss of life. His eyes grew dim and dazzled. His brain swam. He gazed up unseeingly at the blue sky, the tall skyscraper houses, the sweep of human and vehicular traffic around him. And to his excited fancy, the beautiful face of Manella came, like a phantom, between him and all else that was presented to his vision. That face, warm and glowing with woman's tenderness, the splendid dark eyes, aflame with love for a man whose indifference to her only strengthened her adoration. And he seemed to hear the deep, defiant voice of Roger Seaton ringing in his ears. Annihilation! A holocaust of microbes, I would, and could, wipe them off the face of the earth in twenty-four hours. He could, and would. And by heaven, said Gwent within himself, he's done it. End of chapter 22《ハッピーバースデーとは何か》この番組は世界のバックスクリーンの中で配信されています。もし興味のある方がいらっしゃいましたら、ぜひ訪れてください。ハッピーバースデーとは何か。ハッピーバースデーとは何か。ハッピーバースデーとは何か。So men say when, after denying God's existence, ail their lives, the seeming solid earth heaves up like a ship on a storm billow, dragging down in its deep recoil their lives and habitations. An earthquake, its irresistible rise and fall, makes human beings more powerless than insects. Their houses and possessions have less stability than the spider's web, which swings its frail threads across broken columns in greater safety than any man-made bridge of stone. And terror, mad, hopeless, helpless terror, possesses every creature brought face to face with a dire cruelty of natural forces, which from the very beginning have played havoc with struggling mankind. Struck by the hand of God, and with a merciless blow, all the sunny plains and undulating hills of the beautiful stretch of land in Southern California, in the centre of which the Plaza Hotel and Sanatorium had stood, were now unrecognizable. The earth was torn asunder and thrown into vast heaps. Great rocks and boulders were tumbled over each other pell-mell in appalling heights of confusion, and, for miles around, towns, camps, and houses were laid in ruins. The scene was one of absolute horror. There was no language to express or describe it. No word of hope or comfort that could be fitly used to lighten the blackness of despair and loss. Gangs of men were at relief work as soon as they could be summoned, and these busied themselves in extricating the dead, and rescuing the dying whose agonized cries and moans reproached the power that made them for such an end. 
and perhaps as terrible as any other sound, was the savage roar and rush of a loosened torrent, which came tearing furiously down from the cleft hills to the lower land, through the great cannon beyond the site where the plaza had stood, a cannon which had become enormously widened by the riving and the rending of the rocks, thus giving free passage to wild waters that had before been imprisoned in a narrow gorge. The persistent rush of the flood filled every inch of space with sound of an awful, even threatening character, suggesting further devastation and death. The men engaged in their dreadful task of lifting crushed corpses from under the stones that had fallen upon them were almost overcome and rendered incapable of work by the appalling clamour which was sufficient to torture the nerves of the strongest and some of them, sickened at the frightful mutilation of the bodies they found, gave up altogether and dropped from sheer fatigue and exhaustion into unconsciousness, despite the heroic encouragement of their director, a man well used to great emergencies. Late afternoon found him still organising and administrating aid, with the assistance of two or three Catholic priests, who went about seeking to comfort and sustain those who were passing the line between. All the energetic helpers were prepared to work all night, delving into the vast suddenly made grave, wherein were tumbled the living with the dead. And it was verging toward sunset, when one of the priests, chancing to raise his eyes from the chaos of earth around him to the clear and quiet sky, saw what at first he took to be a great eagle, with outspread wings soaring slowly above the scene of devastation. It moved with singular lightness and ease now and then appearing to pause, as though seeking some spot whereon to descend. And after watching it for a minute or two, he called the attention of some of the men around him to its appearance. They looked up warily from their gruesome task of excavating the dead. "'That's an airship,' said one. "'And a big thing, too.' "'An airship?' echoed the priest amazedly, and then was silent, gazing at the shining expanse of sky through which the bird-shaped vessel— made its leisurely way like the vision of a fairy-tale more than any reality. There was something weirdly terrible in the contrast it made, moving so tranquilly through clear space in apparent safety, while down below on the so-called solid earth all nature had been convulsed and overthrown, the wonderful results of human ingenuity, as measured with the remorseless action of natural forces, seemed too startling to be real to the mind of a Spanish priest who— despite all the evidences of triumphant materialism, still clung to the cross and kept his simple, faithful soul high above the waves that threatened to engulf it. Turning anew to his melancholy duties, he bent over a dying youth just lifted from beneath a weight of stones that had crushed him. The boy's fast-glazing eyes were upturned to the sky. "'See the angel coming,' he whispered thickly. "'Never used to believe in them. But there's one sure enough. Glory!' and his utterance ceased for ever. The priest crossed his hands upon his breast and said a prayer, then again looked up to where the airship floated in the darkening blue. It was now directly over the cannon, immediately above the huge rift made by the earthquake, through which the clamorous rush of the water poured. While he watched it, it suddenly stood still, then dived slowly as though bent on descending into the very depths of the gully. He could not forbear uttering an exclamation, which made all the men about him look in the direction where his own gaze was fixed. "'That airship's going to kingdom come,' said one. "'Nothing can save it if it takes to nose-diving down there.' They all stared amazed, but the dreadful work on which they were engaged left them no time for consideration of any other matter. The priest watched a few minutes longer, more or less held spellbound with a kind of terror, for he saw that, without doubt, the great vessel was either purposely descending, or being drawn into the vast abyss yawning black beneath it, and that falling thus it must be inevitably doomed to destruction. Whoever piloted it must surely be determined to invite this frightful end to its voyage, for nothing was ever steadier or more resolute than its downward movement towards the whirling waters that rushed through the cannon. All suddenly it disappeared, whelmed as it seemed in darkness and the roaring flood, and the watching priest made the sign of the cross in air, murmuring, God have mercy on their souls. Had he been able to see what happened, he might have thought that the confused brain of the dying boy, who had imagined the airship to be an angel, 
was not so far wrong, for no romancer or teller of wild tales could have pictured a stranger or more unearthly sight than the wonderful white eagle poised at ease amid the tossed-up clouds of spray flung from the seething mass of waters, while at her prow stood a woman fair as any fabled goddess, a woman reckless of all danger and keenly on the alert, with bright eyes searching every nook and cranny that could be discerned through the mist. Clear above the roaring torrent, her voice rang like a silver trumpet as she called her instructions to the two men who, equally defying every peril, had ventured on this journey at her command. Rivardi and Gaspard. "'Let her down very gently, inch by inch,' she cried. "'It must be here that we should seek.' In absolute silence they obeyed. Both had given themselves up for lost, and were resigned and ready to meet death at any moment. From the first they had made no effort to resist Morgana's orders. She and they had left Sicily at a couple of hours' notice, and their three days' journey across the ocean had been accomplished without adventure or accident, at such a speed that it was hardly to be thought of without a thrill of horror. No information had been given them as to the object of their long and rapid aerial voyage, and only now, when the white eagle, swooping over California, reached the scene of the terrific devastation wrought by the earthquake, did they begin to think they had submitted their wills and lives to the caprice of a madwoman. However, there was no drawing back, nothing for it but still to obey. For even in the stress and terror naturally excited by their amazing position, they did not fail to see that the great airship was steadily controlled, and that whatever was the force controlling it, it maintained its level, its mysterious vibrating discs still throbbing, with vital and incessant regularity. Apparently nothing could disturb its equilibrium, or shatter its mechanism, and, according to its woman designer's command, they lowered it gently till it was, so to say, almost immersed in the torrent and covered with spray. Indeed Morgana's light figure itself at the prow looked like a fair spirit risen from the waters, rather than any form of flesh and blood, so wreathed and transfigured it was, by the dust of the ceaseless foam. She stood erect, bent on a quest that seemed hopeless, watching every eddying curve of the water. Every flickering ripple, her eyes, luminous as stars, searched the black and riven rocks with an eager passion of discovery. When all suddenly, as she gazed, a thin ray of light, pure gold in colour, struck sharply like a finger-point on a shallow pool immediately below her. She looked and uttered a cry, beckoning to Rivardi. "'Come! Come!' he hurried to her side, Gaspard following. The pool on which her eyes were fixed was shallow enough to show the pebbly bed beneath the water, and there lay apparently two corpses, one of a man, the other of a woman, whose body was half flung across that of the man. Morgana pointed to them. "'They must be brought up here,' she said insistently. "'You must lift them. We have emergency ropes and pulleys. It is easily done. Why do you hesitate?' "'Because you demand the impossible,' said Rivardi. "'You send us to death to rescue the already dead.' She turned upon him with wrath in her eyes. "'You refuse to obey me!' What a face confronted him! White as marble and as terrible in expression as that of a Medusa, it had a paralysing effect on his nerves, and he shrank and trembled at her glance. "'You refuse to obey me,' she repeated. "'Then, if you do, I destroy this airship and ourselves in less than two minutes. Choose. Obey and live. Disobey and die.' He staggered back from her in terror at her looks, which gave her a supernatural beauty and authority. The fay woman was fay indeed, and the powers with which superstition had dosed the fairy folk seemed now to invest her with irresistible influence. Choose, she reiterated. Without another word he turned to Gaspard, who in equal silence got out the ropes and pulleys of which she had spoken. The airship stopped dead suspended immovably over the wild waters and almost hidden in spray and though the strange vibrations of its multitudinous discs continued in itself it was fixed as a rock a smile sweet as sunshine after storm changed and softened morgana's features as she saw rivardi swing over the vessel's side to the pool below while gaspard unwound a gear by which he would be able to lift and support the drowned creatures he was bidden to bring "'That's a true noble!' she exclaimed. "'I knew your courage would not fail. "'Believe me, no harm shall come to you.' 
Inspired by her words, he flung himself down, and raising the body of the woman first, was entangled by the wet, thick strands of her long dark hair which, like seaweed, caught about his feet and hands and impended his movements. He had time just to see a face white as marble under the hair. Then he had enough to do to fasten ropes around the body and push it upward while Gaspard pulled, both men doubting whether the weight of it would not alter the balance of the airship, despite its extraordinary fixity of position. Morgana, bending over from the vessel, watched every action. She showed neither alarm nor impatience nor anxiety. And when Gaspard said suddenly, "'It is easier than I thought it would be,' she merely smiled as if she knew. Another few moments and the drowned woman's body was hauled into the cabin of the ship, where Morgana knelt down beside it. Parting the heavy masses of dark hair that enshrouded it, she looked, and saw what she had expected to see, the face of Manella Sorriso. But it was the death-mask of a face, strangely beautiful, but awful in its white rigidity. Morgana bent over it anxiously, but only for a moment, drawing a small vial from her bosom, she forced a few drops of the liquid it contained between the set lips, and with a tiny syringe injected the same at the pulseless wrist and throat. While she busied herself with these restorative meshes, the second body, that of the man, was landed almost at her feet, and she found herself gazing in a sort of blank stupefaction of what seemed to be the graver image of Roger Seaton. No effigy of stone ever looked colder, harder, greyer than this inert figure of man, uninjured apparently, for there were no visible marks of wounds or bruises upon his features, which appeared frozen into stiff rigidity, but a man as surely dead as death could make him. Morgana heard, as in a far-off dream, the Marchese Rivardi speaking. "'I have done your bidding because it was you who bade,' he said, his voice shaking with a tremor and excitement of his daring effort and it was not so very difficult, but it is a vain rescue. They are past recall. Morgana looked up from her awed contemplation of Seaton's rigid form. Her eyes were heavy with unshed tears. I think not, she said. There is life in them. Yes, there is life, though for the time it is paralysed. But, here she gave him the loveliest smile of tenderness. You brave Giulio, you are exhausted and wet through. Attend to yourself first. "'Then you can help me with these unhappy ones. "'And you, Gaspard. "'Gaspard. "'Here, madame. "'You have done so well,' she said, "'without fear or failure.' "'Only by God's mercy,' answered Gaspard. "'If the rope had broken, if the ship had lost balance.' "'She smiled. "'So many ifs, Gaspard. "'Have I not told you it cannot lose balance? "'And are not my words proved true? "'Now we have finished our rescue work, we may go.' We can start at once. He looked at her. There is more weight on board, he said meaningly. If we are to carry two dead bodies through the air, it may mean a heavenly funeral for all of us. The white eagle has not been tested for heavy transport. She heard him patiently, then turned to Rivardi and repeated her words. We can start at once, stare upwards and onwards. Like a man hypnotized, he obeyed, and in a few moments the airship, answering easily to the helm, rose lightly as a bubble from the depths of the cannon, through the fiercely dashing showers of spray tossed by the foaming torrent, and soared aloft, high and ever higher, as swiftly as any living bird born for a long and powerful flight. Night was falling, and through the dense purple shadows of the Californian sky, a big white moon rose, bending ghost-like over the scene of destruction and chaos, lighting with a pale glare the tired and haggard faces of the relief men at their terrible work, of digging out the living and the dead from the vast pits of earth into which they had been suddenly engulfed. While far, far above them flew the white eagle, gradually lessening in size through distance till it looked no bigger than a dove on its homeward way. Some priests watching by a row of lifeless men, women and children killed in the earthquake chanted the nonc dimittis as the evening grew darker, and the only one among them who had first seen the airship over the cannon where it fell, as it were in the deep gulf surrounded by flood and foam, now raised his eyes in wonderment, as he perceived it once more soaring at liberty towards the moon. "'Surely a miracle!' he ejaculated under his breath. "'An escape from destruction through God's mercy! God be praised!' 
and he crossed himself devoutly, joining in the solemn chanting of his brethren, kneeling in the moonlight, which threw a ghastly lustre on the dead faces of the victims of the earthquake. Victims not struck by the hand of God, but by the hand of man, and he who was responsible for the blow lay unconscious of having dealt it, and was borne through the air swiftly and safely away, for ever from the tragic scene of ruin and desolation he had himself wrought. End of chapter 23「Don Aloysius was seen constantly pacing up and down the Lagia, absorbed in anxious thought and prayer, and the Marchese Rivardi came and went on errands of which he alone knew the import. Overhead the sky was brilliantly blue and cloudless. The sun flashed a round shield of dazzling gold all day long on the breast of the placid sea, but within the house blinds were drawn to shade and temper the light for eyes that perhaps might never again open to the blessing and glory of the day. A full week had passed since the White Eagle had returned from its long and adventurous flight over the vast stretches of ocean, bearing with it the two human creatures cast down to death in the deep Californian cannon, and only one of them had returned to the consciousness of life. The other still stayed on the verge of the Great Divide. Morgana had safely landed the heavy burden of seeming death her ship had carried, and simply stating to Lady Kingswood and her household staff that it was a case of rescue from drowning, had caused the two corpses, such as they truly appeared, to be laid each in a separate chamber, surrounded with every means that could be devised or thought of for their resuscitation. In an atmosphere glowing with mild warmth on soft beds they were placed, inert and white as frozen clay, their condition being apparently so hopeless that it seemed mere imaginative folly to think that the least breath could ever again part their set lips, or the smallest pulsation of blood stir color through their veins. But Morgana never wavered in her belief that they lived, and hour after hour, day after day, she watched with untiring patience, administering the mysterious balm or portion which she kept preciously in her own possession. And not till the fifth day of her vigil when Manella showed faint signs of returning consciousness, did she send to Rome for a famous scientist and physician with whom she had frequently corresponded. She entrusted the dispatch of this message to Rivardi, saying, It is now time for further aid than mine. The girl will recover, but the man, the man is still in the darkness. And her eyes grew heavy with a cloud of sorrow and regret, which softened her delicate beauty and made it more than ever unearthly. "'What are they? What is he to you?' demanded Rivardi jealously. "'My friend, there was a time when I should have considered that question an impertinence from you,' she said, tranquilly. "'But yours is the great share of the rescue, and your magnificent bravery wins you my pardon for many things.' And she smiled as she saw him flush under her quiet gaze. What is this man to me, you ask? Why nothing? Not now. Once he was everything, though he never knew it. Some quality in him struck the keynote of the scale of life for me. He was the great delusion of a dream. The delusion is ended, the dream is over. But for that he was to me, though only in my own thoughts. I've tried to save his life, not for myself, but for the woman who loves him. The woman we rescued with him? The woman who is here? She bent her head in assent. Rivardi's eyes dwelt on her with greater tenderness than he'd ever felt before. She looked so frail and fairy-like, and withal so solitary. He took her little hand and gently kissed it with a courteous reverence. Then, after all, you've known love, he said in a low voice. You've felt what it is, though you've assumed to despise it? My good Gulio. 
I do despise most heartily what the world generally understands as love, she replied. There's no baser or more selfish sentiment. A sentiment made up half of animal desire and half of a personal seeking for admiration, appreciation, and self-gratification. Yes, Gulio, it is so, and I despise it for all these attributes. In truth, it is not what I understand or accept as love at all. What do you understand and accept? he asked softly. Her eyes shone kindly as she raised them to his face. Not what you can ever give, Gulio, she said. Love, to my mind, is the spiritual part of our being. It should be the complete union of two souls that move as one, like the two wings of a bird making the body subservient to the highest flights, even as far as heaven. The physical mating of man and woman is seldom higher than the physical mating of any other animals under the sun. The animals know nothing beyond, but we, we ought to know something. She paused, then went on. There is sometimes a great loftiness, even in the physical way of so-called love, such passion as the woman we have rescued has for the man she was ready to die with. A primitive passion of primitive women at her best. Such feeling is out of date in these days. We have passed that boundary line, and a great unexplored world lies open before us. Who can say what we may find there? Perhaps we shall discover what all women have sought from the beginning of things. And that is, he asked, happiness, she replied, the perfect happiness of life and love. He'd held her hand till now when he released it. I wish I could give it to you, he said. You cannot, Gulio. I'm not made for any man, as men go. It is a pity you think so, he said, for, after all, you are just a woman. Am I? she murmured, and a strange flitting smile brightened her features. Perhaps, and yet, perhaps not. Who knows? She left him puzzled and uneasy. Somehow she always managed to evade his efforts to become more intimate in his relations with her. Generous and kind-hearted as she was, she held him at a distance, and maintained her own aloof position inexorably. A less intelligent man than Rivardi would have adopted the cynic's attitude, and averred that a rejection of love and marriage arose from her own lovableness and unmarriageableness, but he knew better than that. He was wise enough to perceive the rareness and delicacy of her physical and mental organization and temperament, a temperament so finely strung as to make all other women seem gross and material beside her. He felt and knew her to be both his moral and intellectual superior, and this very fact rendered it impossible that he could ever master her mind and tame it down to the subservience of married life. That dauntless spirit of hers would never bend to an inferior. Not even love, if she could feel it, would move her thus far. And the man she had adventured to cross ocean to rescue, what was he? She confessed that she had loved him, although the love was past. And now she'd set herself to watch night and day by his dead body, for dead he surely was, in Rivardi's opinion sparing no pains to recover what seemed beyond recovery, while one of the greatest mysteries of the whole mysterious affair was just this. How had she known the man's life was in danger? All these questions Rivardi discussed with Don Aloysius, who listened to him patiently without committing himself to any reply. Whatever Morgana had confided to him, and she had confided much, he kept his own counsel. Within forty-eight hours of Morgana's summons, the famous specialist from Rome, Professor Marco Ardini, noted all over the world for his miraculous cures of those whom other physicians had given up as past curing, arrived. He heard the story of the rescue of a man and woman from drowning with emotionless gravity, more taken for the moment by Morgana herself, whom he'd never seen before, but with whom he had corresponded on current questions of scientific importance. From the extremely learned and incisive tone of her letters, he had judged her to be an elderly woman of profound scholarship, who had spent the greater part of her life in study, and his astonishment at the sight of the small, dainty creature who received him in the library of the Plaza d'Oro was beyond all verbal expression. In fact, he took some minutes to recover from the magnetic shock of her blue eyes and wistful smile. I must be quite frank with you, she said, after a preliminary conversation with the great man in his own Italian tongue. 
These two people have suffered their injuries by drowning, but not altogether. They are the victims of an earthquake, and were thrown by the earth's upheaval into a deep chasm flooded with water. The professor interrupted her. Pardon, signora. There's been no recent earthquake in Europe. She gave a little gesture of assent. Not in Europe, no, but in America. In California, there's been a terrible one. In California? He echoed amazingly. Gran Dio! You do not mean to say that you brought these people from California, across that vast extent of ocean? She smiled. By airship, yes. Really nothing so very remarkable. You will not ask for further details just now, Professor. And she laid her pretty hand coaxingly on his arm. You and I both know how advisable it is to say as little as possible of our own work or adventures, while any subject is awaiting treatment and every moment counts. I will answer any question you may ask when you've seen my patience. The girl is a beautiful creature. She's beginning to regain consciousness. But the man, I fear, is past even your skill. Come. She led the way, and Professor Ardini followed, marveling at her ethereal grace and beauty, and more than interested in the case on which his opinion was sought. Entering a beautiful room, glowing with light and warmth and color, he saw, lying on a bed and slightly propped up by pillows, a lovely girl, pale as ivory, with dark hair loosely braided on either side of her head. Her eyes were closed, and the long black lashes swept the cheeks in a curved fringe. The lips were faintly red, and the breath parted them slowly and reluctantly. The professor bent over her and listened. Her heart beat slowly but regularly. He felt her pulse. She will live, he said. There are no injuries? None, Morgana replied, as he put his questions. Some few bruises, but no bones broken, nothing serious. You have examined her? Yes. You have no nurses? No. I and my house people are sufficient. Her tone became slightly peremptory. There's no need for outside interference. Whatever your orders are, they shall be carried out. He looked at her. His face was a somewhat severe one, furrowed with thought and care. But when he smiled, a wonderful benevolence gave it an almost handsome effect. And he smiled now. You shall not be interfered with, he said. You have done very well. Complete rest, nourishment, and your care are all that this patient needs. She will be quite herself in a very short time. She is extraordinarily beautiful. I wish you could see her eyes, said Morgana, almost as if the uttered wish had touched some recess of her stunned brain. Manella's eyelids quivered and lifted. The great dark glory of the stars of her soul shone forth for an instant, giving sudden radiance to the pallor of her features. Then they closed again as in utter weariness. Magnificent, said Ardini, under his breath, and full of the vital light. She will live. And she will love, added Morgana softly. The professor looked at her inquiringly. The man she loves is in the next room, she continued. We rescued him with her. If it can be called a rescue, he's the worst case. Only you may be able to bring him back to consciousness. I've done my best in vain. If you fail, then we must give up hope. She preceded him into the adjoining chamber. As he entered it after her, he paused, almost intimidated, despite his long medical and surgical experience by the stone-like figure of man that lay before him. It was as if one should have unearthed a statue gray with time, a statue nobly formed, with a powerful head and the severe features sternly set, the growth of beard revealing rather than concealing the somewhat cruel contour of mouth and chin. The professor walked slowly up to the bed and looked at this strange effigy of a human being for many minutes in silence. Morgana watching him with strained but quiet suspense. Presently he touched the forehead, it was stone cold, then the throat, stone cold and rigid. He bent down and listened for the heart's pulsations, not a flutter, not a beat. Drawing back from this examination, he looked at Morgana. She met his eyes with the query in her own, which she emphasized by the spoken word, Dead? 
No, he answered, I think not. It is very difficult for a man of this type to die at all. Granted favorable conditions, and barring accidents caused by the carelessness of others, he ought to be one of those destined to live forever. But, here he hesitated, if I'm right in my surmise, of course it is only a first opinion, death would be the very best thing for him. Oh, why do you say that? she asked pitifully. Because the brain is damaged, hopelessly, this man, whoever he is, has been tampering with some chemical force he does not entirely understand. His whole body is charged with its influence. And this it is that gives his form its unnatural appearance, which, though death-like, is not death. If I leave him alone and untouched, he will probably expire unconsciously in a few days. But if, after what I've just told you, you wish me to set the life atoms going again, even as a clock is wound up, I can relax the tension which now paralyzes the cells, muscles, and nerves, and he will live, yes. Like most people without brains, he will live a long time, probably too long. Morgana moved to the bedside and gazed with a solemn earnestness at the immobile, helpless form stretched out before her, as though ready for burial. Her heart swelled with suppressed emotion. She thought with anguish of the brilliant brain, the strong, self-sufficient nature brought to such ruin through too great an estimate of human capability. Tears rushed to her eyes. Oh, give him life, she whispered. Give him life for the sake of the woman who loves him more than life. The professor gave her a quick, keen glance. You? She shivered at the question as though struck by a cold wind. Then, conquering the momentary weakness, answered, No, the girl you've just seen. He is her world. Ardini's brows met in a saturn frown. Her world would be an empty one, he said with an expressive gesture. A world without fruit or flower, without light or song. A dreary world. But such as it is, such as it is bound to be, it can live on a life and death. Are you quite sure of this? Morgana asked. Can any of us, however wise, be quite sure of anything? His frown relaxed and his whole features softened. He took her hand and patted it kindly. Signora, you know as I do that the universe and all within it represents law and order. A man is a little universe in himself, and if the guiding law of his system is destroyed, there is chaos and darkness. We scientists can say, let there be light, but the fulfilled result, and there was light, comes from God alone. Why should not God help in this case, she suggested. Ah, why? And Ardini shrugged his shoulders. How can I tell? My long experience has taught me that wherever the law has been broken, God does not help. Who knows whether this frozen wreck of man has obeyed or disobeyed the law. I can do all that science allows. And you will do it, interrupted Margana eagerly. You will use your best skill and knowledge. Everything you wish shall be at your service. Name whatever fee your merit claims. He raised his hand with a deprecatory gesture. Money does not count with me, Signora, he said, nor with you. The point with both of us in all our work is success. Is it not so? Yes, and it is because I do not see a true success in this case that I hesitate. True success would mean the complete restoration of this man to life and intelligence. But life without intelligence is no triumph for science. I can do all that science will allow. And you will do this all, said Morgana eagerly. You will forgo triumph for simple pity, pity for the girl who would surely die if he were dead, and perhaps after all God may help the recovery. It shall be as you wish, Signora. I must stay here two or three days. As long as you find it necessary, said Morgana, all your orders shall be obeyed. Good. Send me a trustworthy man-servant who can help to move and support the patient, and we can get to work. I left a few necessary appliances in your hall. I should like them brought into this room, and then, here he took her hand and pressed it kindly. You can leave us to our task and take some rest. You must be very tired. I am never tired, she answered gently. I thank you in advance for all you're going to do.
She left the room then with one backward glance at the inert stiff figure on the bed, and went to arrange matters with her household that the professor's instructions should be strictly carried out. Lady Kingswood, deeply interested, heard her giving certain orders and asked, There is hope, then? Those two poor creatures will live? I think so, answered Morgana with a thrill of sadness in her sweet voice. They will live. Pray God their lives may be worth living. She watched the man servant who she had chosen to wait on Ardini depart on his errand. She saw him open the door of the room where Seaton lay, and shut it. Then there was a silence. Oppressed by a sudden heaviness of heart, she thought of Manila, and entered her apartment softly to see how she fared. The girl's beautiful dark eyes were wide open, and full of the light of life and consciousness. She smiled and stretched out her arms. It is my angel, she murmured faintly, my little white angel who came to me in the darkness, and this is heaven. Swiftly and silently Morgana went to her side, and taking her outstretched arms, put them round her own neck. Manila, she said tenderly, dear beautiful Manila, do you know me? The great loving eyes rested on her with glowing warmth and pleasure. Indeed I know you, and Manila's voice, weak as that of a sick child, sounded ever so far away. The little white lady of my dreams, oh, I've wanted you, wanted you so much. Why do you not come back sooner? Afraid to trouble her brain by the sudden shock of two rapidly recurring memories, Morgana made no reply, but merely soothed her with tender caresses, when all at once she made a violent struggle to rise from the bed. I must go, she cried. He's calling me. I must follow him. Yes, even if he kills me for it, he's in danger. Morgana held her close and firmly. Hush, hush, dear, she murmured. Be quite still. He's safe, believe me. He's near you, in the next room, out of all danger. Oh, no, it is not possible. And the girl's eyes grew wild with terror. He cannot be safe. He's destroying himself. I've followed him every step of the way. I've watched him, oh, so long. He came out of the hut this morning. I was hidden among the trees. He could not see me. She broke off, and a violent trembling shook her whole body. Morgana tried to calm her into silence, but she went on rambling incoherently. There was something he carried as though it was precious to him, something that glittered like gold, and he went away quickly, quickly to the canyon. I followed him like a dog, crawling through the brushwood. I followed him across the deep water to the cave where it was all dark, black as midnight. She paused, then suddenly flung her arms round Morgana, crying, Oh, hold me, hold me. I'm in this darkness trying to find him. There, there. He turns and sees me by the light of the lamp he carries. He knows I have followed him, and he is angry. Oh, dear God, he is angry. He raises his arm to strike me. She uttered a smothered shriek and clung to Morgana in a kind of frenzy. No mercy, no pity. That thing that glitters in his hand, it frightens me. What is it? I kneel to him on the cold stones. I pray him to forgive me, to come with me. But his arm is still raised to strike. He does not care. Here a pale horror blanched her features. She drew herself away from Morgana's hold and put out her hands with the instinctive gesture of one who tries to escape falling from some great height. Morgana, alarmed at her looks, caught her again in her arms and held her tenderly, whereat a faint smile hovered on her lips, and her distraught movements ceased. What is this? she asked, then murmured. My little white lady, how did you come here? How did you cross the flood unless on wings? Ah, you were a fairy, and you can do all you wish to do. But you cannot save him. It is too late. He will not save himself, and he does not care. He does not care, neither for me nor you. She drooped her head against Morgana's shoulder, and her eyes closed in utter exhaustion. Morgana laid her back gently on her pillows, and pouring a few drops of the cordial she had used before, and of which she had the sole secret into a wine glass full of water, held it to her lips. She drank it obediently, evidently conscious now that she was being cared for. But she was still restless and presently she sat up in a listening attitude, one hand uplifted. Listen, she said in a low, odd tone, 
thunder do you hear it god speaks she lay down again passively and was silent for a long time the hours passed and the day grew into late afternoon and morgana patiently watchful thought she slept all suddenly she sprang up wide-eyed and alert what was that she cried i heard him call morgana startled by her swift movement stood transfixed listening the deep tones of a man's voice rang out loudly and defiantly. There shall be no more wars. There can be none. I say so. I am master of the world. End of chapter 24。Chapter 25 of The Secret Power。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Secret Power by Marie Corelli Chapter 25 A brilliant morning broke over the flower-filled gardens of the Palazzo d'Oro, and the sea, stretched out in a wide radiance of purest blue, shimmered with millions of tiny silver ripples, brushed on its surface by a light wind as delicate as a bird's wing. Morgana stood in a rose-marble loggia, looking with a pathetic wistfulness at the beauty of the scene, and beside her stood Marco Ardini, scientist, surgeon, and physician, looking also, but scarcely seeing, his whole thought being concentrated on the case with which he had been dealing. It is exactly as I first told you, he said. The man is strong in muscle and sinew, but his brain is ruined. It can no longer control or command the body's mechanism. Therefore, the body is practically useless. Power of volition is gone. The poor fellow will never be able to walk again or to lift a hand. A certain faculty of speech is left, but even this is limited to a few words which are evidently the result of the last prevailing thoughts impressed on the brain cells. It is possible he will repeat those words thousands of times. The oftener he repeats them, the more he will like to say them. What are they? Morgana asked in a tone of sorrow and compassion. Strange enough for a man in his condition, replied Ardini, and all is the same. There shall be no more wars, there can be none, I say it. I only, it is my great secret, I am master of the world. Poor devil, what a master of the world is there? Morgana shuddered as with cold, shading her eyes from the radiant sunshine. Does he say nothing else, she murmured? Is there no name, no place that he seems to remember? He remembers nothing, he knows nothing, answered Ardini. He does not even realize me as a man. I might be a fish or a serpent for all his comprehension. One glance at his moveless eyes is enough to prove that. They are like pebbles in his head, without cognizance or expression. He mutters the words great secret over and over again, and tacks it on to the other phrase of no more wars, in a semi-conscious sort of gabble. This is, of course, the disordered action of the brain working to catch up and join together hopelessly severed fragments. Morgana lifted her sea-blue eyes and looked with grave appeal into the severely intellectual, half-frowning face of the great professor. Is there no hope of an ultimate recovery, she asked? With time and rest and the best of unceasing care, might not this poor brain right itself? Medically and scientifically speaking, there is no hope. None whatever, he replied, though of course we all know that nature's remedial methods are inexhaustible, and often to the wisest of us seem miraculous, because as yet we do not understand one tithe of her processes. But in this case, this strange and terrible case, and he uttered the words with marked gravity, it is nature's own force that has wrought the damage. Some powerful influence which the man has been testing has proved too much for him, and it has taken its own vengeance. Morgana heard this with strained interest and attention. Tell me just what you mean, she said. There is something you do not quite express, or else I am too slow to understand. Ardini took a few paces up and down the loggia, and then halted, facing her in the attitude of a teacher preparing to instruct a pupil. Signora, he said, when you began to correspond with me some years ago from America, I realized that I was in touch with a highly intelligent and cultivated mind. I took you to be many years older than you are with a ripe scientific experience. 
I find you young, beautiful, and pathetic in the pure womanliness of your nature, which must be perpetually contending with an indomitable power of intellectuality and of spirituality. Spirituality is the strongest force of your being. You are not made like other women. This being so, I can say to you what other women would not understand. Science is my life subject, as it is yours. It is a window set open in the universe, admitting great light. But many of us foolishly imagine that this light emanates from ourselves as a result of our own cleverness, whereas it comes from that divine source of all things which we call God. We refuse to believe this. It wounds our pride. And we use the discoveries of science recklessly and selfishly, without gratitude, humbleness, or reverence. So it happens that the first tendency of godless men is to destroy. The love of destruction and torture shows itself in the boy who tears off the wing of an insect or kills a bird for the pleasure of killing. The boy is father of the man. And we come, after much ignorant denial and obstinacy, back to the inexorable truth that they who take the sword shall perish with the sword. If we consider the sword as a metaphor for every instrument of destruction, we shall see this force of its application, the submarine, for example, built for the most treacherous kind of sea warfare. How often they that undertake its work are slain themselves. And so it is through the whole gamut of scientific discovery when it is used for inhuman and unlawful purposes. When this same sword is lifted to put an end to torture, disease, and the manifold miseries of life, then the power that has entrusted it to mankind endows it with a blessing, and there are no evil results. I say this to you by way of explaining the view I am forced to take of this man whose strange case you ask me to deal with. My opinion is that, through chance or intention, he has been playing recklessly with a great natural force, which he has not entirely understood for some destructive purpose, and that it has recoiled on himself. Morgana looked him steadily in the eyes. You may be right, she said. He is, or was, one of the most brilliant of our younger scientists. You know his name. I have sent you from New York some accounts of his work. He is Roger Seaton, whose experiments in the condensation of radioactivity startled America some four or five years ago. Roger Seaton? he exclaimed. What? The man who professed to have found a new power which would change the face of the world? He, this wreck, this blind deaf lump of breathing clay? Surely he has not fallen on so horrible a destiny. Tears rushed to Morgana's eyes. She could not answer. She could only bend her head in assent. Profoundly moved, Ordini took her hand and kissed it with sympathetic reverence. Signora, he said. This is indeed a tragedy. You've saved this life, at I know not what risk to yourself. And as I am aware what a life of great attainment it promised to be, you may be sure I will spare no pains to bring it back to normal conditions. But frankly, I do not think it will be possible. There is the woman who loves him. Her influence may do something. If he ever loved her, yes. And Morgana smiled rather sadly. But if he did not, if the love is all on her side. Ardini shrugged his shoulders. A great love is always on the woman's side, he said. Men are too selfish to love perfectly. In this case, of course, there's no emotion, no sentiment of any sort left in the mere hulk of a man. But still, I will continue my work and do my best. He left her then, and she stood for a while alone gazing far out to the blue sea and sunlight, scarcely seeing them for the half-unconscious tears that blinded her eyes. Suddenly a ray, not of the sun, shot athwart the lagia and touched her with a deep gold radiance. She saw it and looked up, listening. Morgana. The voice quivered along the ray like the touch string of an aeolian harp. She answered it in almost a whisper. I hear... You grieve for sorrows not your own, said the voice, and we love you for it. But you must not waste your tears on the errors of others. Each individual spirit makes its own destiny, and no other but itself can help itself. 
You are one of the chosen and beloved. You must fulfill the happiness you have created for your own soul. Come to us soon. A thrill of exquisite joy ran through her. I will, she said, when my duties here are done. The golden ray decreased in length and brilliancy, and finally died away in a fine haze mingling with the air. She watched it till it vanished. Then, with a sense of relief from her former sadness, she went into the house to see Manella. The girl had risen from her bed, and with the assistance of Lady Kingswood, who tended her with motherly care, had been arrayed in a loose white woolen gown which carelessly gathered round her intensified by contrast the striking beauty of her dark eyes and hair and ivory pale skin as morgana entered the room she smiled her small even teeth gleaming like tiny pearls in the faint rose of her pretty mouth and stretched out her hand what has he said to you she asked tell me is he not glad to see you to know he is with you safe with you in your home morgana sat down beside her dear manella she answered gently and with tenderest pity he does not know me he knows nothing he speaks a few words but he has no consciousness of what he's saying manella looked at her wonderingly ah that is because he is not himself yet she said the crash of the rocks the pouring of the flood this was enough to kill him but he will recover in a little while, and he will know you. Yes, he will know you, and he will thank God for life to see you. Her unselfish joy in the idea that the man she loved would soon recognize the woman he preferred to herself was profoundly touching, and Morgana kissed the hand she held. Dear, I am afraid he will never know anything more in this world, she said sorrowfully. Neither man nor woman nor can he thank God for a life which he will be long living death, unless you can help him. I, and Manella's eyes dilated with brilliant eagerness, I will give my life for his. What can I do? And then, with patient slowness and gentleness, little by little, Morgana told her all. Lady Kingswood, sitting in an armchair near the window, worked at her embroidery, furtive tears dropping now and again on the delicate pattern as she heard the details of the tragic verdict given by one of europe's greatest medical scientists on the hopelessness of ever repairing the damage wrought by the shock which had shaken a powerful brain into ruins but it was wonderful to watch manella's face as she listened sorrow pity tenderness love all in turn flashed their heavenly radiance in her eyes and intensified her beauty and when she'd heard all, she smiled as some lovely angel might smile on a repentant soul. Her whole frame seemed to vibrate with a passion of unselfish emotion. He will be my care, she said. The good God has heard my prayers and given him to me to be all mine. She clasped her hands in a kind of ecstasy. My life is for him and him alone. He will be my little child, this big, strong, poor, broken man. And I will nurse him back to himself. I will watch for every little sign of hope. He shall learn to see through my eyes, to hear through my ears, to remember all that he has forgotten. Her voice broke in a half sob. Morgana put an arm around her. Manella, Manella, she said. You do not know what I say. You cannot understand the responsibility. It would make you a prisoner for life. Oh, I understand and Manella shook back her dark hair with the little proud, decisive gesture characteristic of her temperament. Yes, and I wish to be so imprisoned. If we'd not been rescued by you, we should have died together. Now you will help us to live together, will you not? You are a little white angel, a fairy, yes. To me you are. Your heart is full of unspent love. You will let me stay with him always, always, as his nurse, his servant, his slave? Morgana looked at her tenderly, touched to the quick by her eagerness and her beauty, now intensified by the glow of excitement which gave a roseate warmth to her cheeks and deeper darkness to her eyes. All ignorant and unsuspecting as she was of the world's malignity and cruel misjudgments, how could it be explained to her that a woman of such youth and loveliness, 
electing to dwell alone with a man, even if the man were a hopeless paralytic, would make herself the subject of a malicious comment and pitiless scandal. Some reflection of this feeling showed itself in the expression of Morgana's face while she hesitated to answer, holding the girl's hand in her own and stroking it affectionately the while. Manella, gazing at her as a worshipper might gaze at a sacred picture, instinctively divined her thought. Ah, I know what you would say, she exclaimed, that I might bring shame to him by my companionship. Always, yes, that is possible. Wicked people would talk of him and judge him wrongly. Oh, Medella, dear, murmured Morgana. Not him, not him, but you. Me? She tossed back her wealth of hair and smiled. What am I? Just a bit of dust in his path. I am nothing at all. I do not care what anybody says or thinks of me. What should it matter? But see, to save him, let me be his wife. His wife? Morgana repeated the words in amazement, and Lady Kingswood, laying down her work, gazed at the two beautiful women, the one so spirit-like and fair, the other so human and queenly, in a kind of stupefaction, wondering if she had heard all right. His wife, yes. Manella spoke with a thrill of exultation in her voice, and she caught Morgana's hand and kissed it fondly. His wife, it is the only way I can be his slave woman. Let me marry him while he knows nothing, so that I may have the right to wait upon him and care for him. He shall never know, for if he comes to himself again, please God he will. As soon as that happens, I will go away at once. He will never know. He shall never learn who it is that has cared for him. You see, I shall never really be his wife, nor he my husband, only in name. And then, when he comes out of the darkness, when he is strong and well once more, he will go to you, you whom he loves. Morgana silenced her by a gesture which was at once commanding and sweetly austere. Dear girl, he never loved me, she said gently. He's always loved himself. Yes, you know that as well as I do. Once I fancied I loved him, but now I know my way of love is not his. Let us say no more of it. You wish to be his wife? Do you think what that means? He will never know he is your husband, never recognize you. Your life will be sacrificed to a helpless creature whose brain is gone, who will be unconscious of your care and utterly irresponsive. Oh, sweet, too loving Manella, you must not pledge the best years of your youth and beauty to such a destiny. Manella's dark eyes flashed with passionate ardor and enthusiasm. I must, I must, she said. It is the work God gives me to do. Do you not see how it is with me? It is my one love, the best of my heart, the pulse of my life, youth and beauty. What are they without him? Ill or well, he is all I care for. And if I may not care for him, I will die. It is quite easy to die, to make an end. But if there is any youth or beauty to spend, it will be better to spend it on love than on death. My white angel, listen and be patient with me. You are patient, but still be more so. You know there will be none in the world to care for him. Ah, when he was well and strong, he said that love would weary him. He did not think he would ever be helpless and ill. Ah, no. But a broken brain is put away, out of sight, to be forgotten like a broken toy. He was at work on some wonderful invention, some great secret. It will never be known now. Not a soul will ever ask what has become of it or of him. The world does not care what becomes of anyone. It has no sympathy. Only those who love greatly have any pity. She clasped her hands and lifted them in an attitude of prayer, laying them against Morgana's breast. You will let me have my way, surely you will, she pleaded. You are a little angel of mercy, unlike any other woman I ever saw, so white and pure and sweet. You understand it all. In his dreadful weakness and loneliness, God gives him to me, happy me, who am young and strong enough to care for him and attend upon him. I have no money, perhaps he has none either, but I will work to keep him. I am clever at my needle. I can embroider quite well, and I will manage to earn enough for us both. 
Her voice broke in a sob, and Morgana, the tears falling from her own eyes, drew her into a close embrace, and she murmured plaintively again, His wife, I must be his wife, his serving woman, then no one can forbid me to be with him. You will find some good priest to say the marriage service for us, and give us God's benediction. It will mean nothing to him, because he cannot know or understand, but to me it will be a holy sacrament. Then she broke down and wept softly till the pent-up passion of her heart was relieved, and Morgana, mastering her own emotion, had soothed her into quietude. Leaning back from her armchair where she'd rested since rising from her bed, she looked up with an anxious appeal in her lovely eyes. Let me tell you something before I forget it again, she said. It is something terrible, the earthquake. Yes, yes, do not think of it now said Morgana hastily, afraid that her mind would wander into a painful mazes of recollection. That is all over. Ah, yes, but you should know the truth. It was not an earthquake, she persisted. It was not God's doing, it was His work. And she indicated by a gesture the next room where Roger Seaton lay. A cold horror ran through Morgana's blood. His work. The widespread ruin of villages and townships the devastation of a vast tract of country, the deaths of hundreds of men, women, and little children, his work, could it be possible? She stood transfixed while Manila went on. I know it was his work, she said. I was warned by a friend of his who came to La Plaza that he was working at something which might lose him his life. And so I watched. I told you how I followed him that morning. How I saw him looking at a box full of shining things that glittered like the points of swords. How he put this box in a case and then in a basket, and slung the basket over his shoulder, and went down into the cannon, and then to the cave where I found him. I called to him, he heard, and held up a miner's lamp and saw me. Then, then, oh dear God, then he cursed me for following him. He raised his arm to strike me and in his furious haste to reach me he slipped on the wet mossy stones. Something fell from his hand with a great crash like thunder, and there was a sudden glare of fire. Oh, the awfulness of that sound and that flame! And the rocks rose up and split asunder. The ground shook and broke under me, and I remember no more, no more till I found myself here, here with you. Morgana roused herself from the stupefaction of horror with which she had listened to this narration. Do not think of it any more, she said in a low, sad voice. Try to forget it all. Yes, dear, try to forget all the mad selfishness and cruelty of the man you love. Poor besotted soul, he has a bitter punishment. She could say no more then. Stooping, she kissed the girl on the white forehead between the rippling waves of dark hair and strove to meet the searching eyes with a smile. Dear beautiful angel, will you help me? Manella pleaded. You will help me to be his wife? And Morgana answered with pitiful tenderness, I will. And with a sign to Lady Kingswood to come nearer and sit by the girl, as she lay among her pillows more or less exhausted, she herself left the room. As she opened the door on her way out, the strong voice of Roger Seaton rang out with singularly horrible harshness. There shall be no more wars. There can be none. I say it. My great secret. I am master of the world. Shuddering as she heard, she pressed her hands over her ears and hurried along the corridor. Her thoughts paraphrased the saying of Madame Roland on Liberty. O oh, science, what crimes are committed in thy name? She was anxious to see and speak with Professor Ardini, but came upon the Marchese Rivardi instead, who met her at the door of the library and caught her by both hands. What is all this? he demanded insistently. I must speak to you. You have been weeping. What is troubling you? She drew her hands gently away from his. Nothing, Giulio, and she smiled kindly. I grieve for the griefs of others quite uselessly, but I cannot help it. There is no hope, then, he said. None, not for the man, she replied. 
His body will live, but his brain is dead. Rivardi gave an expressive gesture. Horrible. Better he should die. Yes, far better. But the girl loves him. She is an ardent Spanish creature. Warm-hearted and simple as a child. She believes. And Morgana's eyes had a pathetic wistfulness. She believes, as all women believe when they love for the first time, that love has a divine power next to that of God, that it will work miracles of recovery when all seems lost. The disillusion comes, of course, sooner or later, but it has to come of itself, not through any other influence. She, Manila Ceriso, has resolved to be his wife. Grand deal! Rivardi started back in utter astonishment. His wife? That girl? Young, beautiful? She will chain herself to a madman? Surely you will not allow it. Morgana looked at him with a smile. Poor Giulio, she said softly. You are a most unfortunate descendant of your Roman ancestors as far as we women are concerned. You fall in love with me, and you find I am not for you. Then you see a perfectly lovely woman who you cannot choose but admire, and a little stray thought comes flying into your head, yes, quite involuntarily, that perhaps, only perhaps, her love might come your way. Do not be angry, my friend. It was only a thought that moved you when you saw her the other day, when I called you to look at her as she recovered consciousness and lay on her bed like a sleeping figure of the loveliest of pagan goddesses. What man could have seen her thus without a thrill of tenderness? And now you have to hear that all that beauty and warmth of youthful life is to be sacrificed to a stone idol. For the man she worships is little more. Ah, yes, I am sorry for you, Giulio, but can do nothing to prevent the sacrifice. Indeed, I have promised to assist it. Rivardi had alternately flushed and paled while she spoke. Her keen, incisive probing of his most secret fancies puzzled and vexed him. But with a well-assumed indifference, he waved aside her delicately pointed suggestions, as though he had scarcely heard them, and said, You have promised to assist? Can you reconcile it to your conscience to let this girl make herself a prisoner for life? I can, she answered quietly, for if she is opposed in her desire for such imprisonment, she will kill herself so it is wisest to let her have her way. The man she loves so desperately may die at any moment, and then she will be free. But meanwhile, she will have the consolation of doing all she can for him, and the hope of helping him to recover. Vain hope as it may be, there is a divine unselfishness in it. For she says that if he is restored to health, she will go away at once, and never let him know she is his wife. Rivardi's handsome face expressed utter incredulity. Will she keep her word, I wonder? She will. Marvelous woman. And there was bitterness in his tone. But women are all amazing when you come to know them. In love, in hate, in good and evil, in cleverness, and in utter stupidity, they are wonderful creatures. And you, Amicabella, are perhaps the most wonderful of them all. So kind and yet so cruel. Cruel? she echoed. Yes, to me. She looked at him and smiled. That smile gave such a dreamy, spirit-like sweetness to her whole personality that for the moment she seemed to float before him like an aerial vision rather than a woman of flesh and blood. And the bold desire which possessed him to seize and clasp her in his arms was checked by a sense of something like fear. Her eyes rested on his with a full, clear frankness. If I am cruel to you, my friend, she said gently, it is only to be more kind. She left him then and went out. He saw her small elfin figure pass among the chains of roses, which at this season seemed to tie up the garden in brilliant knots of color, and then go down the terraces one by one towards the monastic retreat half buried among pine and olive, where Don Aloysius governed his little group of religious brethren. He guessed her intent. She will tell him all, he thought. And with his strange, semi-religious, semi-scientific notions, it will be easy for her to persuade him to marry the girl to this demented creature 
who fills the house with his shouting, There shall be no more wars. I should never have thought her more capable of tolerating such a crime. He turned to leave the Legia, but paused as he perceived Professor Ardini advancing from the interior of the house, his hands clasped behind his back, and his furrowed brows bent in gloomy meditation. You have a difficult case, he queried. More than difficult, replied Ardini. Beyond human skill. Perhaps not beyond the mysterious power we call God. Rivardi shrugged his shoulders. He was a skeptic of skeptics, and his modern world experiences had convinced him that what man could not do was not to be done at all. The latest remedy proposed by the Signora is love, he said carelessly. The girl who is here, Manella Ceriso, has made up her mind to be the wife of this unfortunate Ardini gave an expressive gesture. Altro! If she has made up her mind, heaven itself will not move her. It will be a sublime sacrifice of one life for another. What would you? Such sacrifices are common, though the world does not hear of them. In this instance, there is no one to prevent it. You approve? You tolerate it? exclaimed Rivardi angrily. I have no power to approve or to tolerate, replied the scientist coldly. The matter is not one in which I have any right to interfere, nor, I think, have you. I have stated such facts as exist, that the man's brain is practically destroyed, but that owing to the strength of the life centers he will probably exist in his present condition for a full term of years. To keep him so alive will entail considerable care and expense. He will need a male nurse, probably two, food of the best and absolutely tranquil surroundings. If the signora, who is rich and generous, guarantees these necessities, and the girl who loves him desires to be his wife under such terrible conditions, I do not see how anyone can object to the marriage. Then he poor devil of a man will be married without his knowledge, and probably if he had his senses against his will said Rivardi. Ardini bent his brows yet more frowningly. Just so, he answered, but he has neither knowledge nor will, nor is he likely ever to have them again. These great attributes of the God and man have been taken from him. Power and will, will and power, the two wings of the soul, they are gone, probably forever. Science can do nothing to bring them back, but I will not deny the possibility of other forces which might work a remedy on this rune of a master of the world, as he calls himself. Therefore, I say, let the love woman try her best. End of chapter 25。Chapter 26 of The Secret Power this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Secret Power by Marie Corelli. Chapter 26 Don Aloysius sat in his private library, a room little larger than a monastic cell, and at his feet knelt Morgana like a child at prayer. The rose and purple glow of the sunset fell aslant through a high royal window of painted glass, shedding an areole round her golden head, and intensified the fine, dark, intellectual outline of the priest's features as he listened with fixed attention to the soft, pure voice, vibrating with tenderness and pity as she told him of the love that sought to sacrifice itself for love's sake only. In your creed and in mine, she said, there is no union which is real or binding save the spiritual, and this may be consummated in some way beyond our knowledge, when once the sacred rite is said. You need no explanation from me, you who are a member and future denizen of the Golden City, you who are set apart to live long after these poor human creatures have passed away with the unthinking millions of the time. And you can have no hesitation to unite them as far as they can be united so that they may at least be saved from the malicious tongues of an always evil-speaking world. 
You once asked me to tell you of the few moments of real happiness I've known. This will be one of the keenest joys to me if I can satisfy this loving-hearted girl and aid her to carry out her self-chosen martyrdom. And you must help me. Gently, Eliseus laid his hand on her bent head. It will indeed be a martyrdom, he said slowly. Long and torturing. Think well of it. A woman, youthful and beautiful, chained to a mere breathing image of man, a creature who cannot recognize either persons or objects, who is helpless to move, and who will remain in that pitiable state all his life, if he lives. Dear child, are you convinced there is no other way? Not for her, Morgana replied. She has set her soul to try if God will help her to restore him. She will surround him with the constant influence of a perfectly devoted love. Dare we say there should be no healing power in such an influence? We who know so much of which the world is ignorant? He stroked her shining hair with a careful tenderness, as one might stroke the soft plumage of a bird. And you, he said in a low tone, what of you? She raised her eyes to his. A light of heaven's own radiance shone in those blue orbs, an angelic peace beyond all expression. What should there be of me except the dream come true? She responded, smiling. You know my plans. You also know my destiny. For I've told you everything. You will be the controller of all my wealth, entrusted to carry out all my wishes, till it is time either for you to come where I am or for me to return hither. We never know how or when that may be, but it has all seemed plain sailing for me since I saw the city called Brazen, but which we know is golden, and when I found that you belonged to it, and were only stationed here for a short time, I knew I could give you my entire confidence. It is not as if we were of the passing world or its ways. We are of the new race, and time does not count with us. Quite true, he said. But for these persons in whom you are interested, time is still considered, and for the girl it will be long. Not with such love as hers, replied Morgana. Each moment, each hour, will be filled with hope and prayer and constant vigilance. Love makes all things easy. It is useless to contend with the fate which both the man and woman have made for themselves. He is, I should say he was, a scientist who discovered the means of annihilating any section of humanity at his own wish and will. He played with the fires of God and brought annihilation on himself. My discovery, the force which moves my airship, the force that is the vital element of all who live in the Golden City, is the same as his, but I use it for health and movement, progress and power, not for the destruction of any living soul. By one single false step he has caused the death and misery of hundreds of helpless human creatures, and this terror has recoiled on his own head. The girl Manella has no evil thought in her. She simply loves. Her love is ill-placed, but she also has brought her own destiny on herself. You have worked, and so have I, with the universal force, not as the world does, against it and we have made ourselves what we are and what we shall be. There is no other way, either forward or backward. You know there is not. Here she rose from her knees and confronted him, a light aerial creature of glowing radiance and elfin loveliness. And you must fulfill her wish, and mine. He rose also and stood erect, a noble figure of a man with a dignified beauty of mind and feature that seemed to belong to the classic age rather than ours. So be it, he said. I will carry out all your commands to the letter. May I just say that your generosity to Giulio Rivardi seems almost unnecessary? To endow him with a fortune for life is surely too indulgent. Does he merit such bounty at your hands? She smiled. Dear Father Eliseus, Giulio has lost his heart to me she said, or what he calls his heart, he should have some recompense for the loss. He wants to restore his old Roman villa, and when I am gone he will have nothing to distract him from this artistic work. I leave him the means to do it. I hope he will marry. It is the best thing for him. 
She turned to go. And your own Palazzo d'Oro? Will become the abode of self-sacrificing love, she replied. It could not be put to better use. It was a fancy of mine. I love it in its gardens. And I should have tried to live there had I not found out the secret of a large and longer life. She paused, then added, Tomorrow morning you will come? He bent his head. Tomorrow. With a salute of mingled reverence and affection, she left him. He watched her go, and hearing the bell begin to chime in the chapel for vespers, he lifted his eyes for a moment in silent prayer. A light flashed downward, playing on his hands like a golden ripple, and he stood quietly expectant and listening. A voice floated along the ray. You are doing well and rightly, it said. You will release her now from the strain of seeming to be what she is not. She is of the new race, and her spirit has advanced too far to endure the grossness and materialism of the old generation. She deserves all she has studied and worked for. Lasting life, lasting beauty, lasting love. Nothing must hinder her now. Nothing shall, he answered. The ray lessened in brilliancy and gradually diminished till it entirely vanished. And Don Eliseus, with the rapt expression of a saint and visionary, entered the chapel where his brethren were already assembled and chanted with them. Magna opera domini, exquisita in ominous voluntarius ejus. The next morning, all radiant with sunshine, saw the strangest of nuptial ceremonies, one that surely had seldom, if ever, been witnessed before in all the strange happenings of human chance. Manella Ceriso, pale as a white orm lily, her rich dark hair adorned with a single spray of orange blossom gathered from the garden, stood trembling beside the bed where lay stretched out the immobile form of the once active, world-defiant Roger Seaton. His eyes, wide open and staring into vacancy, were like dull pebbles fixed in his head. His face was set and rigid as a mask of clay. Only his regular breathing gave evidence of life. Manella's pitiful gazing on this rune of the man to whom she devoted her heart and soul, her tender sorrow, her yearning beauty, might have almost moved a stone image to a thrill of response but not a flicker of expression appeared on the frozen features of that terrible fallen pillar of human self-sufficiency. Standing beside the bed with Manella was Marco Ardini, intensely watchful and eager to note even a quiver of the flesh or a tremor of muscle, and near him was Lady Kingswood, terrified yet enthralled by the scene, and anxious on behalf of Morgana, who looked statuesque and pensive like a small attendant angel close to Don Eliseus. He, in his priestly robes, read the marriage service with soft and impressive intonation, himself speaking the responses for the bridegroom. And taking Manella's hand, he placed it on Seton's, clasping the two together, the one so yielding and warm, the other stiff as marble, and setting the golden marriage ring which Morgana had given on the bride's finger. As he made the sign of the cross and uttered the final blessing, Manella sank on her knees and covered her face. There followed a tense silence. Eliseus laid his hand on her bent head. God help and bless you, he said solemnly. Only the divine power can give you strength to bear the burden you have taken on yourself. But at his words she sprang up, her eyes glowing with a great joy. It is no burden, she said. I have prayed to be his slave, and now I am his wife. That is more than I ever dared to dream of. For now I have the right to care for him, to work for him, and no one can separate me from him. What happiness for me! But I will not take a mean advantage of this. Ah, no, no good, father. Listen, I swear before you and the holy cross you wear that if he recovers he shall never know. I will leave him at once without a word. He shall think I am a servant in his employ. Or rather he shall not think at all about me, for I will go where he can never find me, and he will be as free as he ever was. Yes, truly, by the blessed Madonna, I swear it. I will kill myself rather than let him know. She looked regally beautiful, her voice flushed with the pride and love of her soul, and in her newly gained privilege as a wife she bent down and kissed the pallid face 
though lay like the face of a corpse on the pillow before her. He is a poor wounded child just now, she murmured tenderly, but I will care for him in his weakness and sorrow. The doctor will tell me what to do, and it shall all be done. I will neglect nothing. As for money, I have none, but I will work. Morgana put an arm about her. Dear, do not think of that, she said. For the present you will stay here. I am going on a journey very soon, and you and Lady Kingswood will take care of my house till I return. Be quite satisfied. You will have all you want for him and for yourself. Professor Ardini will talk to you now and tell you everything. Come away. But Manella was gazing intently at the figure on the bed. She saw its gray lips move. With startling suddenness, a harsh voice smote the air. There shall be no more wars. There can be none. My great secret, I am master of the world. She shrank and shivered and a faint sobbing cry escaped her. Come, said Morgana again, and gently led her away. The spray of orange blossom fell from her hair as she moved, and Don Aloysius, stooping, picked it up. Marco Ardini saw his action. You will keep that as a souvenir of this strange marriage, he said. No. And Don Aloysius touched the white fragrant flower with his crucifix. I will lay it as a votive offering on the altar of the Eternal Virgin. About a fortnight later, life at the Palazzo d'Oro had settled into organized lines of method and routine. Professor Ardini had selected two competent men attendants, skilled in surgery and medicine, to watch Seton's case with all the care trained nursing could give, and himself had undertaken to visit the patient regularly and report his condition. Seton's marriage to Manella Ceriso had been briefly announced in the European papers and cabled to the American press, Senator Gwent being one of the first who saw it thus chronicled, much to his amazement. He has actually become sane at last, he soliloquied, and beauty has conquered science. I gave the girl good advice. I told her to marry him if she could, and she's done it. I wonder how they escaped that earthquake. Perhaps that brought him to his senses. Well, well, I dare say I shall be seeing them soon over here. I suppose they are spending their honeymoon with Morgana. Curious affair. I'd like to know the ins and outs of it. Have you seen that Roger Seaton is married? Was the question asked of him by everyone he knew, especially by the flashing society butterfly, once Lydia Herbert who in these early days of her marriage was getting everything she could out of her millionaire. And not to Morgana? Just think. What a disappointment for her. I'm sure she was in love with him. I thought so, Gwyn answered cautiously. And he with her. But one never knows. No one ever does, laughed the fair Lydia. Poor Morgana, left on the stock. But she's so rich it won't matter. She can marry anybody she likes. Marriage isn't everything, said Gwent. To some it may be heaven, but to others. The worser place, agreed Lydia. And Morgana's not like ordinary women. I wonder what she's doing, and when we shall see her again. Yes, I wonder, Gwent responded vaguely, and the subject dropped. They might have had more than ordinary cause to wonder had they been able to form even a guess as to the manner and intentions of life held by the strange half-spiritual creature whom they imagined to be but an ordinary mortal moved by the same ephemeral aims and desires as the rest of the grosser world, who, even among scientists, accustomed as they are to study the evolution of grubs into lovely rainbow-winged shapes, and the transformation of ordinary weeds into exquisite flowers of perfect form and glorious color, goes far enough or deep enough to realize similar capability of transformation in a human organism self-trained to so evolve and develop itself, who, at this time of day, even with the hourly vivid flashes kindled by the research lamps of science, reverts to former theories of men like de Gabalis, who held that beings in process of finer evolution and formation, and known as elementals nourishing their own growth, into exquisite existence, through the radio force of air and fire, 
may be among us, all recognized, yet working their way out of lowness to highness, indifferent to worldly loves, pleasures, and opinions, and only bent on the attainment of immortal life. Such beliefs serve only as material for the scoffer and iconoclast. Nevertheless, they may be true for all that, and may in the end confound the mockery of materialism, which in itself is nothing but the deep shadow cast by a great light. The strangest and most dramatic happenings have the knack of settling down into the commonplace, and so in due course the days at the Palazzo d'Oro went on tranquilly. Manila being established there and known as the Bella Signora Seton by the natives of the little surrounding villages, who were gradually brought to understand the helpless condition of her husband and pitied her accordingly. Lady Kingswood had agreed to stay as friend and protectress to the girl as long as Morgana desired it. Indeed, she had no wish to leave the beautiful Sicilian home she had so fortunately found, and where she was treated with so much kindness and consideration. There was no lack or stint of wealth to carry out every arranged plan, and Manella was too simple and primitive in her nature to question anything that her little white angel, as she called her, suggested or commanded. Intensely grateful for the affectionate care bestowed upon her, she acquiesced in what she understood to be the methods of possible cure for the ruined man to whom she had bound her life. If he gets well, quite, quite well, she said, lifting her splendid dark eyes to Morgana's blue as love in a mist, I will go away and give him to you. And she meant it, having no predominant idea in her mind save that of making her elect beloved happy. Meanwhile, Morgana announced her intention of taking another aerial voyage in the White Eagle, much to the joy of Giulio Rivardi, receiving his orders to prepare the wonderful airship for a long flight. He and Gaspard worked energetically to perfect every detail, where he had previously felt a certain sense of fear as to the capabilities of the great vessel, controlled by a force of which Morgana alone had the secret. He was now full of certainty and confidence, and told her so. I am glad, he said, that you were leaving this place, where you have installed people who to me seem quite out of keeping up with it. That terrible man who shouts, I am master of the world. Ah, cara Madonna, I did not work at your fairy Palazzo d'Oro for such an occupant. I know you did not, she answered gently. Nor did I intend it to be so occupied. I dreamed of it as a home of pleasure where I should dwell alone. And you said it would be lonely, you remember? I said it was a place for love, he replied. You were right, and love inhabits it, love of the purest, most unselfish nature. Love that is a cruel martyrdom, he interposed. True, and her eyes shone with a strange brilliancy. But love, as the world knows it, is never anything else. There, do not frown, my friend. You will never wear its crown of thorns. And you are glad that I am going away? Yes, glad that you will have a change, he said. Your constant care and anxiety for these people whom we rescued from death must have tired you out unconsciously. You will enjoy a free flight through space, and the ship is in perfect condition. She will carry you like an angel in the air. She smiled and gave him her hand. Good Giulio, you are quite a romanticist. You talk of angels without believing in them. I believe in them when I look at you, he said, with all an Italian's impulsive gallantry. Very pretty of you and she withdrew her hand from his too fervent clasp. I feel sorry for myself that I cannot rightly appreciate so charming a compliment. It is not a compliment, he declared vehemently. It is the truth. Her eyes dwelt on him with a wistful kindness. You were what some people call a good fellow, Giulio, she said, and you deserve to be very happy. I hope you will be so. I want you to prosper so that you may restore your grand old villa to its former beauty. 
I also want you to marry and bring up a big family. Here she laughed a little. A family of sons and daughters who will be grateful to you and not waste every penny you give them, though that is the modern way of sons and daughters. She paused, smiling at his moody expression. And you say everything is ready? The white eagle is prepared for flight? She will leave the shed at a moment's touch, he answered, when you supply the motive power. She nodded comprehensively and thought a moment. Come to me the day after tomorrow, she said. You will then have your orders. It is to be a long flight this time, he asked. Not so long as to California, she answered, but long enough. With that she left him, and he betook himself to the air shed where the superb white eagle rested all a quiver for departure, palpitating, or so it seemed to him, with a strange eagerness for movement which struck him as unusual and uncanny in a mere piece of mechanism. The next day moved on tranquilly. Morgana wrote many letters and varied this occupation by occasionally sitting in the Legia to talk with Manella and Lady Kingswood, both of whom now seemed the natural inhabitants of the Palazzo d'Oro. She spoke easily of her intended air trip, so that they accepted her intention as a matter of course, Manella only entreating, Do not be long away, her lovely, eloquent eyes emphasizing her appeal. Now and again the terrible cries of, There shall be no more wars, there can be none, my great secret, I am master of the world, rang through the house despite the closed doors, cries which they feigned not to hear, though Manella winced with pain as at a dagger thrust each time the sounds echoed on the air. And the night came, mildly glorious, with a full moon shining in an almost clear sky, clear save for little delicate wings of snowy cloud, drifting in the east like wandering shapes of birds that haunted the domain of sunrise. Giulio Rivardi leaning out of one of the richly sculptured window arches of his half-ruined villa, looked at the sky with pleasurable anticipation of the morrow's intended voyage in the White Eagle. The weather will be perfect, he thought. She will be pleased. And when she is pleased, no woman can be more charming. She's not beautiful like Manila, but she's something more than beautiful. She is bewitching. I wonder where she means to go. Suddenly a thought struck him, a vivid impression coming from he knew not whence. An idea that he had forgotten a small item of detail in the airship, which its owner might or might not notice but which would certainly imply some slight forgetfulness on his part. He glanced at his watch. It was close on midnight. Acting on a momentary impulse, he decided not to wait till morning, but to go at once down to the shed and see that everything in and about the vessel was absolutely and finely in order. As he walked among the perfumed tangles of shrub and flower in his garden and out towards the seashore, he was impressed by the great silence everywhere around him. Everything looked like a moveless picture, a study in still life. Passing through a little olive wood which lay between his own grounds and the sea, he paused as he came out of the shadow of the trees and looked towards the height crowned by the Palazzo d'Oro, where from the upper windows twinkled a few lights showing the position of the room where the master of the world lay stretched in brainless immobility, waited upon by medical nurses ever on the watch, and a wife of whom he knew nothing, guarding him with the fixed devotion of a faithful dog rather than of a human being. Going onwards in a kind of abstract reverie, he came to a halt again on reaching the shore, enchanted by the dreamy loveliness of the scene. In an open stretch of dazzling brilliancy, the sea presented itself to his eyes, like a delicate network of jewels finely strung on swaying threads of silver, and he gazed upon it as one might gaze on the fairylands forlorn of Keats in his enchanting posy. Never surely, he thought, had he seen a night so beautiful, so perfect in its expression of peace. He walked leisurely. The long shed which sheltered the airship was just before him, its black outline silhouetted against the sky. But as he approached it more nearly, 
Something caused him to stop abruptly and stare fixedly, as though stricken by some sudden terror. Then he dashed off at a violent run, till he came to a breathless halt, crying out, Grandio, it is gone! Gone! The shed was empty. No airship was there, poised trembling on its own balance, all prepared for flight. The wonderful white eagle had unfurled its wings and fled. Whither? Like a madman, he rushed up and down, shouting and calling in vain. It was after midnight, and there was no one about to hear him. He started to run to the Plaza d'Oro to give the alarm, but was held back, held by an indescribable force which he was powerless to resist. He struggled with all his might, uselessly. Morgana! he cried in a desperate voice. Morgana! Running down to the edge of the sea, he gazed across it, and up to the wonderful sky through which the moon rolled lazily like a silver ball. Was there nothing to be seen there save that moon and the moon-dimmed stars? With eager, straining eyes, he searched every quarter of the visible space. Stay! Was that a white dove soaring eastwards? Or a cloud sinking to its rest? Morgana! he cried again, stretching out his arms in despair. She has gone, and alone! Even as he spoke, the dove-like shape was lost to sight beyond the shining of the evening star. L'Envoy Several months ago, the ruin of a great airship was found on the outskirts of the great desert, so battered and broken as to make its mechanism unrecognizable. No one could trace its origin. No one could discover the method of its design. There was no remnant of any engine, and its wings were cut to ribbons. The travelers who came upon its fragments half buried in the sand left it where they found it, deciding that a terrible catastrophe had overtaken the unfortunate aviators who had piloted it thus far. They spoke of it when they returned to Europe, but came upon no one who could offer a clue as to its possible origin. These same travelers were those who a short time since filled a certain section of the sensational press with tales of a brazen city seen from the desert in the distance, with towers and cupolas that shone like brass or like the city of pure gold, revealed to St. John the Divine, where in the midst of the street of it is the tree of life. Such tales were and are received with scorn by the world's majority, for whom food and money constitute the chief interest of existence. Nevertheless, tradition sometimes proves to be true, and dreams become realities. However this may be, Morgana lives, and can make her voice heard when she will along the sound ray, that wonderful wireless which is soon to be declared to the world. For there is no distance that is not bridged by light, and no separation of sounds that cannot be again brought into unison and harmony. There are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamed of in our philosophy, and the Golden City is one of those things. Masters of the world are poor creatures at best, but the secret makers of the new race are the gods of the future. The End End of Chapter 26 End of The Secret Power by Marie Corelli